Hello and welcome to the show. Another bright Monday ahead of us. Myself, Shane Stamps and Michael Verney with me as ever. Michael, how are you? All good, Shane. Yeah, all good. Another busy weekend. Oh, any amount of stuff happened. Football and hurling. And also, just a reminder, we're brought to you by retro.com If you want to get any of these cool jerseys, maybe this Watford one here. Maybe Does it look like I'm another Tipperary man lining up for a, for a Watford transfer after the weekend? <laughs> it just was, maybe. So, uh, that Cork one, any of the brilliant ones that are on display here. Uh, support org use the promo code our game for 15 percent off um the comments are already flying in here with flash afternoon lads hope you had a good weekend certainly did got through some amount of um, some amount of gea we've got fergal hartley coming up uh, john fogarty here is commenting saying uh, fergal hartley is going to be a tip man who gets you over the line discuss already looking to sew the boot in there as well or maybe a tipperary man who's looking to find some crumbs of comfort you'd be hard f- uh, pressed to find a waterford person that would care uh, where Liam Cahill uh, is from, if he had to get us over the line. Anyway, Michael Verney, where do you want to start? Um, I, I, you know something. I, the significance of the Antrim and Leash game yesterday, I think, was huge. And by Jesus, it was some character shown by Leash after going down to fourteen men early in the first half. A huge result, and uh, you know, I was delighted. I was delighted it got the TV exposure uh, that it deserved as well, because in the overall importance of the league, it was a monster of a game for both sides. And it looked like Antrim had done the hard work to get back into a game that where they were five or six down and just couldn't really get going. And then just a phenomenal kind of finish by Leash. And, you know, I, I don't know if there's, uh, if there's ever been a player like Charlie Dwyer to look like he's taken on a hopeless shot and nine times out of ten it goes over the bar. Like, he, he's literally the sort of player where you have to say, you know, Chat, you're allowed to shoot from anywhere. You're kind of an exception to the to the team rule because he scored a point under the stand in the first half that was outrageous. He scored what looked like a hit and hope uh, to, to win it. Um, he's just one of these kind of real exceptions to, to most rules. And, you know, it's funny. We probably wrote off Leash going into the Antrim game last year in the champ- in the championship to, to an extent after the Wexford game. They were under pressure going in against Westmead in that Division 1 relegation uh, playoff after the championship was played last year and they still managed to pull it out of the bag. It's like just when... Just when it's like you know uh, the boy said in Dumb and Dumber, you know, just when you couldn't get any dumber, just when you think we're gone, we're back, we're back again. Just a huge result for them, massive result. You've gone down the Dumb and Dumber route when you could have gone down the Godfather route. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. But <laughs> there you had, go. You That's probably to... what I was looking for. But uh, you're probably a bit a bit more refined than me in terms of films and stuff like that. I just love that mindless comedy. Yeah, in terms of just the films, is it? No, I think there, there's far more that I'm more refined at. But anyway, I don't like going on about it. Chad Oyer did have a couple of, like, um, I would have thought, fairly low percentage chances, shots in the first half, where I, if I was a least supporter, I would have been a little bit frustrated. But like you said, he got four from play for a finish. That last one was brilliant. Um, and Antrim, like, after going behind by six points in the first half, like, Jack Kelly had got sent off. And you thought all of a sudden here, this gives Antrim the impetus to turn the game around after kind of a slow start. But from the 25th minute until half time, Leash won the game by five points to one, up by six. Now Antrim made a decent comeback and actually had themselves in a winning position going into injury time. I think it was uh, Paddy Burke gave them the lead after Conal Cunning and Owen Campbell had scored. But then PJ Scully, who came on and hit over a beautiful sideline, then he hit a free over from the sideline underneath the covered stand around the 65, give or take. And then they turn over the short puck out. And look, I'm all about short puck outs. Don't get me wrong. But it's just when it doesn't work out, when you get turned over, and then someone like Chad Dwyer knocks over an injury time winner, and you end up kind of more or less all but being certain now of being in a relegation playoff, it really does sting. The the issue I have with the short puck out is, is I think it's all to do with timing. 
at the end of the day, I think you know if a team is gonna if a team is gonna hit a winner, I think you really have to make them earn it. If you like, I you know I'd be putting the ball, I'd be putting the ball down in the other end of the pitch. Uh, and flooding a few bodies around it, and giving yourself a chance to win it, giving yourself a chance to win a free and a scoreable position as well. Now that's kind of it's kind of a double edged sword. We're trying to do what they perceive as the right thing and trying to stick to their process, but it kind of broke down bad. And you had to feel sorry for for Stephen Rooney, it was just a, a mis miscontrol. And I'm saying that the ball probably should have been to hand, and if it was to hand, then you know, he wouldn't have had to take a touch. And even that was uh, the case with Limerick a couple of times over the weekend as well. You know, we talked about how slick their passing is. A lot of it was down around down around here, which, which we're not used to as well. Just shows you the importance of going to hand. But um, disappointing from them. Even they had a chance probably to create, uh, you know, a leveling score as well and just weren't able to, to just look the big kind of uh, looked a bit kind of nervy at different times. Um, crucial kind of junctures in the game, and you know that's that's the biggest game of the year so far. They're probably going to have another big game against. Uh, could be Offaly. Could also could also be Limerick, as you said. As you said to me, if Offaly beat Limerick, Limerick are in a relegation playoff, which is, as you said, like that's that's actually hard to believe. Like I know it's a very unlikely uh, thing to happen, but it's very very hard to believe. But that's a huge game for Antrim. The last thing they want is to go back down to Division Two, having gone down to the Joe McDonough last year. Like potentially they could be facing the twenty twenty three season in Division Two. And in the Joe McDonough, which is a couple of steps back from you know this year and even last year as well. I think that's the sixth competitive win in a row that Leash have over Antrim, and I think one of our commenters, that, yeah, James S, says Leash have Antrim's number and no one else's. So that you know, I mean, maybe we'll see how that go, um, goes as the year progresses. Brodo Gakon said, "How was PJ Scully only brought on for Leash in the last ten minutes?" Phenomenal player. He's a really good player, but obviously we don't know. Maybe there's an injury situation. Maybe they're they're just given different players game time at the moment hadn't played much Shane up until this point by all accounts and like he basically like the picky went off and they had to replace a like for like because you know at the end of the game you're going to need a good free taker so he probably only had that amount in him I'd say at this stage yeah a, a special word for Paddy Purcell like his goal early on in the game I felt that that Leash were going for goals early James Key Keys had pretty a pretty tame enough effort really early on then Paddy Purcell drove through got his goal by the way, James Key's really good from centre forward there. He got a couple of scores. Willie Dunphy had a bit of an off day, but still got himself two points on the board, so no harm there. And Picky with eight points, uh, all but two were placed balls. On the other side, Neil McManus scored a nice goal, 1-7 overall. And they had a lot of different scores. But if I told you how many wides they had and compared it with leashes, you'd say that was the difference. 17 wides for Antrim, 10 in the second half with the game in the melting pot when they were coming back. 13 for for leash so you lose a game by four and you four extra or one and you four extra whites i mean that's a killer it's a killer and even just uh i was down at tip and waterford yesterday and even at the start of the second half whites can really kill you like jason ford hit three or four whites early in the second half when tip were looking to tag on and just kind of sucks all momentum away from you and does the same with antrim yesterday they probably should have been it shouldn't have been so close to the end by the time they were getting up a point. They probably should have been up a, up a couple of points at that stage and not left themselves open to that kind of little sucker punch at the end, you know? Yeah, Sean O'Sullivan with a great point. Have to feel bad for Antrim. Last four games with a scoring differential of minus 10 only. Very unlucky. Yeah, they have been really competitive. Serious showdown in Nolan Park next weekend, says Richard Hogan. Uh, when is RIP coming back on, lads? Not sure what you mean, Jack Emeraldo. Let us know. Keep an eye on TG Carr Sunday week for a super Sunday of a final hurling round. Should be good. Definitely should be. And there was another point I wanted to make. Yeah, Mike Verdi, we have to kind of front up a little bit on this. On the, on the Patreon show last Thursday, our preview of the weekend, we decided to do a hurling power rankings. We're not looking great, are we, after the weekend that was. I'm sure everyone knows the results and, uh, and we'll go through them all as we're going along. We still have Limerick at number one. So on the left-hand side in the in the grey, that was our first power rankings of the year. On the right-hand side, that's our, our most recent power rankings from last Thursday. The weekend has shaped things a little bit. I'll just run through it and sort of give context of how they've been doing. Limerick, obviously, four games without a win, three red cards, and um, there they are, winless. They're still at number one for us. Warford, who are going well at two. Cork fly in three. Dublin battered at home by Kilkenny, who are number eight, uh, Dublin in at four. Tipperary beaten well by Watford in at number five. Wexford, they continue to win. They're already into a league semi-final at six. Galway at seven. Uh, Clare nine after drawing with Limerick. Antrim ten ahead of Leash, who beat them 
So now they've relegated them potentially in both competitions. And Westmead, who lost a shock defeat to Down in at number 12 there. We're not looking too clever, are we? What's that on my face? Egg, yeah. is it? <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> lots Send of lots them over of, here. It's like a, it's a spatula, but it's very, it's very good. I'm just going to move it over to yours as well. <laughs> um, does doesn't look great at this moment in time. Um, I I, I don't know. I, I I maybe I felt like I betrayed myself by having killed Kenny so far far down the the. And you were the one pushing them down because I was there. Like, are we sure we have them down here? They're back to back Leinster champions. They're they're a championship team. Yeah, now they're well, what are they? They've three wins from four and have a chance of getting to a league get get into a league semi final if they beat Waterford uh, next weekend. It's unreal. Um, oh, it's it's the most foolish thing in the world, probably just to write off Cody and Kilkenny in, in any way. And if you looked at the team they had out the other day, and you're thinking like, there's not that many regulars here. There's a lot lot of new faces, like of Keen Kenny, David Blanchfield. Blanchfield was brilliant again the other day, by the way. Tom Feeling, lads that we haven't seen much of. And it doesn't really seem to matter who the faces are. They still seem to, just still seem to kind of grow almost when they're in that Kilkenny jersey. So, uh, like, Clare have probably gone up a spot. Kilkenny have gone up a couple of spots. Tip have, have gone down a couple of spots, I would say. Um, Leash should, be, should be going up a spot. Maybe Westmead should be going down a spot. But that's, that's kind of, that's the beauty of hurling at the moment is that... Um, it's very, very hard to predict at this moment in time. Very, very hard to predict, and for long, you know, for long enough, it's probably been too predictable. So it's it's probably uh, probably a great problem to have. Yeah, we're getting a fair bit of jip now from the from the viewers, and that's the way we like it. Sean O'Sullivan says Limerick. It's only January, still Limerick. It's only February, also Limerick. It's only March. Joe Butler, a Kilkenny man, I suppose Kilkenny will now go down the rankings again. We only have an average of ten players scoring for play. So in, point, Joe. Bro. So we're gonna, in. We're going to take it on the chin. I can't believe Michael Verney put them down at eight. Kieran Fenley, there is scope for a lot of changes in the power rankings this time of year. Come championship, though, things will settle into norm normality. Patrick Hickey, Dublin are the spurs of hurling. Promise so much and let you down. Dublin's place in the ranking was valid before the Kilkenny game. It was literally a three-point game before the Kilkenny goal. But I suppose I could say as a Tipperary man, Tipperary were going to find us until the final 20 minutes when uh, when the day should blew up Tipperary. So, um. You know, you can look at it that way. By the way, Seamus P on Patreon said, lads, your power rankings are in tatters after Kilkenny gave Dublin such a hammer. By the way, if you want to sign up for Thursday's shows, we've had great stuff. We had Owen Larkin last week. We had Andy Maloney. We had John Myler the week before. Go to patreon.com forward slash our game. It works out at about 50 cent per podcast over the course of the year, which I'm sure you'll agree is very good value. Philip O'Brien says, uh, Galan very loose with the hurley. We're going to come to them in a, in a little bit of time. But an interesting point was made by Michael McMullen of Gaelic Life. He talked about the return of the Ulster Senior Hurling Championship. So Antrim obviously looks like they're now going into a relegation playoff. They may stay up. They're in the Joe McDonough. But he was more so talking about all the other teams in Ulster that are making strides. Like Down are doing really, really well. They're in a great spot. They could, they could um, potentially get themselves into a promotion final to get up to the top tier next year. Derry have four wins from four in Division 2B. Tyrone are top of 3A. Fermanagh have three wins from 3 and 3B. So, I mean, look at it at the moment. Antrim Derry, he suggested Antrim Derry and Down in the semi finals as the top ranked teams in the league in Ulster, and the rest play in a shield with the four team taking a semi final spot. I mean, it was an interesting proposal from Michael. No, it definitely is. Um, and you have to say, there's probably there's a, a lot of good, good work going on with very little, maybe uh, not very little, but you wouldn't think of too much help from GAHQ, but there's just a lot of lads just getting down and dirty and getting the work done. Like Ronan Sheehan has taken down massively up the peck or taken brought them massively up the peck in order in recent years. They're beaten in a Christy Ring Cup final by Kildare in 2020. Uh, retained their status last year in the Joe McDonough, having been promoted. Uh, were really, really competitive in league last year. They're in a really good position now. Like beating beating Westmead on a way soil yesterday. That's a huge. That's a huge result. That's like that's five or six point uh, five or six points better than they were. You know, even this time twelve months ago. So that's a huge result. As you say they their Derry beat Donegal in in two B, which is probably and Donegal another team going well. And we're we're are now three from four. That's probably um uh, that was probably an appetizer to what's going to be the league final between those two. Tyrone flying for Mana flying as well, and and what what Michael said there about Antrim down and Derry basically been in the semi-finals and the rest playing in a shield type of a setup with the winner going into the semi-finals 
Like I, that's it's definitely competitive games. Listen, are Antrim gonna still win the bulk of the Ulster Championships? They probably are, but like hugely beneficial for Down, hugely beneficial for Derry. Um, and you know if if Antrim want to look at more players, I think it would be hugely beneficial for them as well. So I think the the time is probably nearing closer that it would make sense for it to happen again. That's if Antrim, you know, don't win the Joe McDonough and go into Leinster. Like if they if they don't, I think twenty twenty three it would make sense for the Ulster uh, Ulster Senior Hurling Championship to come back definitely. Yeah, and I think we've got Fergal Hartley coming in now, so I'll just bring him on screen in a second. But just uh, first off, we might as well talk about the scoreline: Watford one twenty eight, Tipperary twenty one points. Um, you know, I, I was looking at a, a tweet last night from let me who, see was Niall Howard. And he was talking about how big a win it was. And he said, um, you know, the big Watford wins over Tipperary are thin on the ground. And he said only five uh, times have they won by more than a goal. And you have to go back to 1970 to find the only uh, victory bigger than today. So the only other one of the five came last year. So we'll bring in Fergal Hartley here. Fergal, um, you're probably feeling pretty happy about Watford today. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you'd have to come away from uh, you'd have to come away from Welsh Park yesterday fairly positive for sure. I mean, look at um, I don't want to quite say one 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 swallow doesn't make a summer, but it is it's still early days. Albeit the championship is only six weeks away, uh, it's still early days. But certainly, look the signs yesterday, and, and and from a water perspective, purely with which a water had on, and looking at the players that still have to come back, you'd be, you'd, you'd be quite positive for sure. Yeah, Michael. Just on that, Shane, what you said there, like wins have been few, uh, ten on the ground. The last three times they played Tipperary, they've beaten them, and they've put up they've put up huge scores. A huge score in the championship was a four twenty eight last year, mm. uh, one twenty eight yesterday. They beat them. I think it was four twenty three. They scored in the Walsh, in Walsh Park last year when they met in the league as well. So like they're big wins, uh, Forgan. Something I'm only thinking uh, with Bally Gunner winning the Club All Ireland and with how well Waterford have been going in recent years. Um, you know the pressure of winning all Ireland is that more of a an expectation now? Like it's not a pre not so much a pressure. It's we're nearing that point where we're good enough. We feel we're good enough to win an all Ireland. There's no, uh, it's not as much pressure now. Where it's almost like we're taking that expectation on our shoulders and we're kind of getting ready to do it rather than actually it's something it being something that maybe might cripple you. Yeah, and I I I I'd agree, Michael. And I think it's very different from possibly the way it would have been a number of years ago. I mean, there was two phases in the last twenty years where there was almost an expectation uh, that 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 Watford were going to go on and, and win an All Ireland, particularly after the defeat to Galway in the All Ireland final in 2017. I think the 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 the, the incorrect assumption from Joe Public in Watford was that well we're we're close and the natural next step is to go on and win an All Ireland, and there was a high level of expectation there. And obviously the following year wasn't a good one from our perspective. And if you go back to the days of Justin McCarthy as well, particularly in 2007, 2008, there was kind of an expectation that it's the natural next step, but I don't think it's like that now. I think there's um, there's 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 hope, uh, but there's realis realism in terms of the expectation as well. I think, you know, everyone is, is, is aware that there is still a building process going on, but I think there's an awareness as well that if you look at even Bookie's odds at the moment, I mean, how, when, you know, when was the last time that typical Kenya or Cork were not in the top three teams uh, in terms of favourites to, to go on and win in All Ireland, uh, geez, has that ever happened? I wonder that they weren't in the top three. And Warford are one of those top three now. I think that's about right. But I think there's an element of, of, of realism here as well. I don't think there's a. I think everyone knows. Look, I mean, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be reading a whole lot into Limerick's league form. I'm, I'm sure John Kiley won't be speaking in those terms, but I think everyone knows that there is a gap to Limerick still, regardless of what's happening in this league. So I don't think there's high expectations like there has been in the past, which I think it's a good balance. I think there's hope. I think there's a certain level of belief, but um, not unrealistic expectations. And I think there's an appreciation for the work. I, I, I think every county... Um, just wants to see their team going out and absolutely empty themselves in the field. So I think it's an appreciation of what's happening here with a relatively young team. Um, yes, I hope that it can happen, but not an unrealistic expectation that it will. How enjoyable is it to watch Waterford at the moment, Fergal? From you know, from a Waterford point of view, like from a neutral's point of view, I love I love watching them. The pace they bring to it. Uh, there was a couple of clips even on Alliance League Sunday last night. Like the intensity in the tackle 
Um, you know, they were driving Tipperary lads back. There was an instance there in the second half where Brian McGrath was hit not once, twice, but probably three times and, and knocked back there. It's real kind of ravenous kind of stuff, full of energy, high octane. I love watching it. I presume from Waterford, Waterford supporters' point of view, it's something that uh, definitely excites you as well. Yeah, it was brilliant, Michael. Yeah, and and, and to be honest, um, you could actually see it in the warm up. Uh, Waterford warmed up right in front of where I was, and I mean, Jesus, I've seen a thousand, the same as yourself, you've seen a thousand warm up drills in terms of shooting drills and whatnot, but this off the shoulder run. So when you say that energy, and Liam, Liam, um, um, Liam Sheedy re- referenced the word energy last night on 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 on, on um, the Sunday game, um, that was and it was lacking in Tipperary. Um, it was in the tackle, but it was also in the support run. I mean, every team now is probably some playing a similar variation of the same tactic to some extent, at least. You know, everybody's trying to work that ball more around that middle third and you know um, trying to pick the right time to make the pass inside or shoot from distance like trying to work it into a position where you can shoot from midfield area far 65 or get it into the corners in the space and everyone's doing some variation of that but what Watford seemed to be doing better than most at the moment certainly better than tip yesterday was um was the the off the shoulder run bringing the ball into contact taking the man out by actually bringing it into contact so if i'm running at you and i'm i'm actually going right into the contact I've taken that man out of the game. And as a man like Daryl Lyons in particular was brilliant at coming off the shoulder yesterday. And the second thing, as you say, then was the intensity of the attack. And those two things go hand in hand to some extent in, in, in my world because they overturn. And then once they overturn you, they're actually going, there's players running at, at speed. Even the very first point of the game from Kieran Bennett was a perfect example of just, just the pace at which they were running at. And if I've been honest, guys, you know, which I think would be disappointing from a temporary perspective, because this is something completely within your control. Warford looked fitter and stronger than, than than Tipperary yesterday. Now, whether that's just an energy thing, you know, when you're winning and, you know, when you're winning, it's easy to be full of running as well, like, right? But certainly that's the way it looked. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'm not suggesting for a second Tipper unfit, but I think Warford have reached a supreme level of fitness that maybe it looked yesterday like Tipperary didn't have, couldn't match. Mm. I was going to ask you, Fergal, um, what about these periods where Watford dominated the game and were able to just up the intensity? So there was a period in the first half. Tip had started well. I think there were maybe something like 8-2 or 8-3 ahead. Watford went on an eight-minute stretch of scoring 1-6 to nothing. The final 20 uh, minutes of the game, Watford scored 10 points. Tip only scored one, and they had only three shots during that period. Why is it you think that the, Do you think it's a physical thing and an athleticism deficit that allows Watford to do that to Tip? Yeah, I, 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 I think so. Um, I, I would also say though yesterday that, like, I didn't see the Antrim game now, but but I saw the the, the Dublin game, and um, you know, it, it, it wasn't that easy against Antrim, or it wasn't that easy against Dublin. I know Leash was a, a, a different game completely, and probably not too much could be read into that. But I have to say, some of that you'd have to say was down to Tipperary as well. Um, if I'm being honest. I, Tiberi looked a little bit rudderless at times. So what I thought about Tiberi, which I say was this again, I don't know, I'm not, I certainly wouldn't be writing off Tip for All Ireland because he can never write off Tiberi. But you know, Tiberi looked like they lacked belief yesterday. They lacked, like it, it was when Warford got on top, it looked like they had no response, and that's not something you typically associate with Tiberi. Any of the traditional counties, when a team gets on top, of you generally speaking, you know, they've they, they, they've they've enough belief in themselves based on tradition, largely, um, not. To, I don't want to quite say tip through in the towel. That 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 might be too harsh, but they certainly had no response when when Warford got on top. There was no real tip response. You're expecting, and if you look at it the other way around, tip went nine three up when Warford after 17 minutes, they were nine three up. You know there was a breeze there, but I'm not sure how big a factor the breeze is in the modern game when you have this caliber of player. I mean, the, the caliber of player on that field yesterday can still score from 60. There's the scoring zone against the breeze. There's still 65 yards and in, even against a reasonably strong breeze. Now I know the scoring zone is a bit. Rather than you can score from the half backs if you like to your Jamie Burns and your Callum Lines and all that, they can they, and, and here in the daily, even for ourselves, you can score from your half back and with the breeze. But nonetheless, in the modern game, every team should be able to work the ball to the, the at least to the midfield, far 65, your own 65, far 65, and shoot from there, even against the breeze. The point being is that you know, when 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 uh when Tip got on top of Waterford. Warford at nine three up, all be playing with a strong breeze. Warford responded and you know didn't look like they knew what they were doing. Looked like even even when they went nine three down, you sense that Warford didn't look like they were in trouble here. But when Warford got on top of tip, you just couldn't see a response coming. Like it wasn't. It's easy to say in hindsight at times, but even during the game, 
in that second half, you know, when Waterford got on a run, you just you weren't you were looking wondering where is the response going to come from Tipperary? It didn't look like it, it didn't feel like it was going to come. And is that a belief thing? Is it a, is it is it is it down to the fact that the players they have, and in fairness, the players that they're trying to replace are some of the best players of a generation, you know, um the Park Mars and Brendan Mars and the Shamie Callens this one. I mean they're, they're they're as good as we've seen. So you know a bit like Kilkenny when you you lose your Tommy Welshes and your Richie Hogan's and whatnot. Is it you know can you assume that you're going to have players of that caliber coming back in? And maybe in the fullness of time some of these players will become great players. But as as of yesterday, it was looking like the caliber they had on the field wasn't as good as what they had in the past. And you know they just looked like there was no response coming. What's behind that? I don't know. For me. It possibly is belief when when you're in a when you're in a rebuild, which I think Tipperary are, uh, it is that bit harder. I think you know it is that bit harder. It's a change of regime. Uh, you know you don't have a name sheeted there. So it's a change of regime. You're into a full rebuild, and then when things go against you, maybe that depth of belief that would have been traditionally in Tipperary wasn't there. But something was amiss that when Morford got on top, um, Tipperary just didn't didn't have a response, but didn't even look like they were going to have a response. Yeah, it's a fair point. Dermot Coyne says, agree with Fergal. Tip look devoid of confidence and the fighting spirit. They seem trapped in a game plan and all the natural instincts are gone. Michael, you were down at the game yourself. Was this the game where you could understand why Liam Cahill chose to stay with Waterford rather than uh, go with Tipperary? <laughs> I was waiting for that one. And, and um, by the way, was there, was there any jip coming in from the crowd about it? I didn't notice any at all. And I just asked Liam after. Um, I think if anyone was going to give Jip, probably yesterday probably wasn't the day to do it. I'd say you probably leave it for a Munster yeah. Championship. Um, Imagine if you did it in the first 50 minutes when Tip were going okay and then you had to go through the last 20 minutes. <laughs> they'd, yeah. they'd probably have locked the Tip fans in for the last 20 minutes and make a match. I'm not sure who it was. There was some, I can't remember, some major sports player. Maybe it was Michael Jordan actually talking recently. You know, it's easy for um, it's easy for lads to have a go at you and get in your face when you're winning a game or something like that. But you, like the lad that gets in your face and will you know give you the bit of smack talk when he's losing or something like that is probably a different prospect altogether. But I would expect, uh, and Liam Cattle expects it to be a lot more kind of hostile maybe when they meet uh, in, six, in six weeks' time. But if you were looking at the two teams yesterday, you're definitely looking at, you know, Watford have much more scope to, to go to a higher level, you think, than Tip at the moment. Uh, you know, Tip's, Tip couldn't get uh, get their hand on the ball from their own puck out. Could not get their hand on the ball from their own puck out. They tried to, Barry Hogan was trying to place balls in different areas, but generally it was, you know, five Watford men to three Tip men or four to two. They they really, really had had that, that kind of sussed out, didn't let them get any primary ball. And we know Tip are very, very good on the ball excellent on the ball but they were just denied primary possession so often the rooks was a, would have been a massive worry from a Tipperary point of view like there was there were several rooks as there are in many games but Watford were the ones that were going in like their life depended on it and coming out with the ball uh, invariably Speed is an issue as well. Yeah. yeah, speed is an issue as well, Shane. I have to say, and mm. I think speed in in the in the tip defence is a bit of an issue. Um, I don't know if there was an element of not that Watford held back a small bit, but like Kieran Bennett got through at the very start, and you're thinking mm, he he might he might go a little bit further. If it's six weeks time, I think he might go a little bit further. Jack Prender, Prendergast broke through a few times, and you're thinking, oh, if this was championship, he might just take another couple of steps and see could they work a goal um and i think uh, i'd be there'd be a bit of worry um from a tip point of view that you know when they meet in six weeks time that you know Watford have the potential to have four or five goals on any team and particularly a team that they have more pace against and i definitely think they match up with really well against tip you're looking at it then you throw desi hutchinson back into the mix uh you throw parik matney back into the mix you throw jamie Barron back into the mix caleb lines and i do think the league getting far in the league really, really would suit Waterford because you integrate Jamie Barron back in, you have c- a couple of competitive games, you integrate Caleb Lyons back in, you get Desi Hutchinson back in. Interesting, Liam Cattle was talking yesterday, just asking about the Bally Gunner lads, how much of a bo- boost was it to have them back? And he said, Yeah, it's, it's great to have them back and whatever. But he said, th- There's a massive gap between club and county, fitness wise. And he said, Even their first few sessions back, they've struggled with that. So I think the extra games will definitely help Parik Matany, Mikey Matany, um, Ian Kenny and all these guys mix mix back in. And just something I'd throw to you, Fergal, 
uh, and you were obviously uh, I think you were involved in a, in a league winning team or I think you were, I think you were anyway um, maybe not you know you weren't around in 07 still apologies awfully you were actually the only team to beat Waterford in 07 that's my my poor claim to fame <laughs> but how important do you think it is from Cattle's point of view he's been there two years massive progress all our final appearance all our semi-final appearance beating you know a load of big guns but how important do you think it is to actually get hands on silverware um, he's only you know an infinite amount of titles you can win. How important do you think that is for Waterford to actually win something? Well, yeah, I, I, I think his tenure, be it this year or next year, you know, and and, and who knows thereafter. I suspect somewhere along the way, Tip will come knocking again. I, I, I is my is my gut feel. Um, but uh, somewhere along the way, I think you know his tenure in Waterford will be defined by by silverware like right be that monster league or or, or or hopefully an all Ireland like right um but yeah absolutely i think you know coming to Watford and saying that um you know y- you've you've progressed things you know and i don't think there's any doubt that he has um i don't think it'll be enough for him knowing the character that he is um and, and equally for i think most people in Watford, yeah of course you're, you're 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 hoping and expecting there will be some silverware to show for the progress that has been made because there's huge progress being made because to be fair when he took over we were in a bit of a rebuild as well and you know if you looked at the personnel that he had and some of those personnel now and it's always that kind of you know it's always that which came first the chicken or the egg thing is is you know some of these players are now looking like they are serious serious inter-county players but when he took them over they might not look that way. You know, you were looking like these are young players and, and are they going to make it or are they not going to make it? And you can say the same with Limerick, by the way. I mean, all these players now are considered top, top inter-county players. But when the current regime took over, you know, we weren't looking at multiple all-stars and multiple hundreds of years and, and so on. So um, I think it's on a sad. There's no one ever going to question, I think, certainly up to date, the, 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 the quality of what he's done here. It's done a huge, huge job from where he took over as well in terms of of effectively in a rebuild, but but ultimately I think he will want uh, his tenure here to be defined by Silver. Yeah, for sure. Just a uh, quick one, uh, Fergal. Just ask you about Jack Fagan. I thought it was an interesting move to to move him back wing back. I wasn't sure if it was going to be a long term thing. Um, Liam said they have the option to put him back up half forward if you know if the case allows it or they need him there in a different game. But what do you think of him at wing back? Uh, I it was the first time to see him in the flesh playing wing back yesterday. I thought the physicality he brought to the brought to the game was huge, particularly under the high ball. Um, and you know, is it potentially with a view to coming up against a like Garrod Hegarty or a Tom Morrissey later on in the year? Yeah, I think so. And uh, interestingly, uh, you know, from watching Club World and Watford, I've never seen him playing wing back before. He, before the move in Watford, and, and and I think he's all the natural attributes of, of a wing back. But it's a savagely competitive nine there. If you like that, you know, you have you have Callum Lyons, and Callum Lyons coming back into that. I mean. He's one of our go-to men now, like right. And you, you, I mean, you, you, you have Ozzy to come back as well. And you mentioned Jamie Barron and obviously, um, and obviously Desi as well. And they're almost four, assuming they're fit, they're almost four definite starters. And then you put put Boric Manny and 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 the other Bally Gunner lads like Peter Hogan and Ian Kenny and so on, and um, um, into the mix there. So it's going to be savagely competitive. So Jack Fagan is, is playing half back now. I'm not sure if Callum Lyons comes in and he takes Jack Fagan's place. Can you then turn around come championship and just throw him up in the forwards not having played or, and not just because he's not used to the position but obviously there's a whole kind of an ecosystem going on there the way players play now you know it has to be a real understanding of how they're all playing together it's, it's such you know the days of a fella doing his own thing playing his own position and doing his own thing are just completely gone everyone's working as part of a system and i don't think you can just slot in and just albeit he's been there last year but not having done that in whatever six seven eight months since he'll have done it just slot into half forward and off you go again I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's certainly far from ideal. So, um, you know, I, I, Callum Lyons' bit for me has to start. You know, I know he's, 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 he's still he's still trying to recover from injury, and his position is number five. Does that mean you put Jack Fagan over to number seven? And if so, I mean, Neil Daly is fine as well. So it's savagely competitive for places. But he 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 has all the attributes of a half back, possibly even more so than the attributes of a half forward because he's a he's a he's a he's a massively aggressive, massively physical guy. Like and as you say, in terms of matchups with the likes of Limericks and the Hegarty's and the and the Tom Morrissey's, um certainly he ha- he has all the attributes for that for sure. I tell you, you're sickening Shane here talking about all these options. You're absolutely sickening him. <laughs> as you were naming them out there, I could see his confidence going down into his boots. Well, look, I mean, if I am to talk about some of the positives for Tipperary yesterday, I thought Barry Hogan did all right in goals. I thought Cahill Barrett did okay. I think James Quigley had an okay game. Uh, 
Dylan Quirk and, and Barry Heffern and times, you can see them working pretty well in terms of like, if you're trying to bring in this new game plan of working the ball through the hands, which Tipper, you know, they're only just starting it out. And you could see Colin Bonner at times probably scratching his head. I mean, there's a few lads that I think are slightly out of position. I don't think Brian McGrath and the full back line necessarily works there. I think his hurling is needed elsewhere. Obviously, like some of the pace that Watford have is going to expose players. Paddy Cadell, I think he's a half back. I don't think he's a midfielder. And I think he struggles to get into the game. He's out midfield. I think Connor Bow was a real positive. He obviously spent last year with the footballers. And a couple of times I thought he broke the lines and he looks like a ball winner. I thought he was quite good. Michael Breen got four. Mark Kyo got four. Looked good. And Jake Morris, of course, is like he's probably that sort of game breaker for Tipperary. But um, do, do you think, uh, Fergal, I, I know you probably don't care, but do you think uh, Tipperary could turn it around a little bit come championship? Or is there just too many kind of things about the team that would suggest, you know, there's a long way to go? Oh, well, absolutely. By the way, I mean, oh, geez, would I write off Tipperary? Never. I mean, a bit like Kilkenny, you just can't write off Tipperary, like, right? And, um, I mean, they have some players to come back in as well, like, right? But, um, uh, I, I, I mean... Could I see him winning all Ireland this year? Probably not, if I'm being honest. Um, but the, the, could, could they be? Could they be a uh, you know last four for sure? Could they be? You know, could, you know, under day can they get to a final? Absolutely. I, I, I mean, are they right now today? Would you would you would you would rank them as a top four team based on what we've seen so far? Possibly not, and that's the first time you'd say in a hell of a long time. Tipper on the top four team. Now maybe we're being naive on this as well, lads. And it is only it is only the National League. And how many times, in some cases, the National League has been a predictor of of championship performance. But in many cases, possibly in more cases, it it, it hasn't been. Like I mean, still, regardless of Limerick's performance at the moment, I know Limerick and Tipper are in completely different scenarios and situations. But Limerick are still a red hot favourites to win the All Ireland, regardless of what's happening in the National League. Now I do think when you're rebuilding, you need the confidence of the National League to to get some good results on your belt, which which Tipperary haven't. The one thing, I mean, another positive from yesterday, by the way, guys, was that, I mean, um, I think Tip got 16 scores from play. I mean, more for think got 115 from play. Tip got 16. So in terms of scores from play, I know that's a, oversimplifying it because that's not the reality of the game. But Tip only scored a handful of scores from freeze. Um, you know, so so maybe it's their problem that they were actually conceding freeze, if you like. But and ultimately, the, the, the end result was, was very convincing. But they did get a good... They did get a good score from Brain. There were some really, you know, cameos that were superb. It was just the consistency. I mean, Mark Yo got some beautiful scores. Connor Bogue got some beautiful scores. Um, I thought, you know, at, at Jake Morris, he got one or two scores. There was one shown on the Sunday game last night. I'm not sure did you see it, but it certainly didn't do it justice. In in the real world, I think Mike Lee said you were there. Um, the one he got where he kind of, Jesus, there was a whole, there, was a, there must have been six or seven Warford players there and he jinked and his foot was superb. And mm. um, I mean, it really was a score that the, the television didn't do justice to. Um, so, I mean, he's a real, real danger player. So have they got top players? Of course they have. Um, because they're, they're, based on what we've seen so far, they've got a very mixed league. Yeah, there's there, there's work to do to turn it around for sure, and um and, uh, and and time is running out because I mean six weeks to championship is not a long time, and in terms of trying to get a lot of because I did feel yesterday whether it was energy or fitness I don't know or possibly a combination of both, but they were overrun by Waterford at times, and you know, you're in the middle of a national league trying to turn that around uh, in six weeks. I'm not saying it can't be done, but but certainly there's no uphill battle. I have one question for you, Fergal. Actually, just we, we'll talk about Cork Galway in a second, and in general, the way hurling is going at the moment. Because um, you were saying to me in a text when I was teeing you up about doing the show about a bit of bite being gone from from the game. But we'll come, you know, in terms of the tactics. But we'll come back to that in a minute. But the one thing about Waterford, you've touched on it that Ozzy Gleeson has to come back in, Desi Hutchinson, uh, uh, Ian Kenny, and there, there's a couple of more names, Peter Hogan, and so on. You know, sometimes you, you've got this club team and you spend four or five months building it for the year and then you bring in your county players and you're like, how do we plug him back in without ripping yeah. up the whole script? Is that a danger for Watford now when they try to work in those lads and Ozzy and Caleb Lyons and Jamie Barron? Or do you think that there's a flexibility to the way that this Watford team set up that you can plug and play with, with any of the players that he has? Yeah, I, I, I think the latter to some extent, but I take your point. I take your point 100%. I mean, you no... Know, what we saw yesterday was 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 very impressive, and you know you you, you bring in a, and and because there's potentially five or six changes that can be made um, mm. to the team that we saw lined out yesterday, and uh, but I think he has everybody on the same page, and it was a bit like the Irish rugby team at times. So sometimes the Irish rugby team, it almost felt like it didn't matter 
what the personnel were, they all just came in, they plugged into a system and, you know, almost the name didn't matter, if you like, the, 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 the same result. You were going to get the same kind of performance and the same result. I think there's an element of that. And then when you bring in the likes of Ozzy, who has been playing well, and, I mean, Jamie Barron came back from injury last year and, Jesus, it was like he he, he never left down a hurley. Like, I mean, guys like him, I mean, they're those guys at their best, you know, that they're... they're they're as good as there are in the country, and uh, I, I they're, they're too good almost to leave. They are too good to leave out, but it, it takes it back to your point. Is it going to impact on the system? My feeling, given you know the people in charge, knows the answer to that question. I think they will. I think they will plug in seamlessly. I think. I hope. Mm, actually, one final question for you, then, Michael. Before we t- touch on another game, Michael Kiley, can can he be dropped? I mean, it's not that he put up a massive score yesterday. But the way he turns and goes at his man, his physicality, holding lads up, opposition defenders coming out, he looks like a player that'll be hard to leave out. Yeah, he's a different type of a player as well. Um, and maybe they don't have another player like that at the moment, but they can just put ball down on top of. Now, I thought they were a tad one-dimensional in a way with some of the ball they put into him. And I don't know, I have a suspicion that there was an element of shadow boxing in a way. And even in the, in the, the last 20 minutes when they were on top, they didn't have much interest in goals as well, whereas I think if if the same situation arises in Munster, they'll go for the throat. But he's definitely a, a different type of player. Uh, he just he, when he gets that ball in his hand and he turns, as you say, he's very very hard stop, and he would create like he, he's a completely different player to Desi Hutchinson. And I think they could complement each other really really well. And you need you know you need to have lots of different strings to your bow. You can't just have all forwards that do the same thing like. If you have a full forward like that available to you, it's a blessing because they have, you know, a fleet footed corner forward like Desi Hutchinson beside him and maybe Jack Prendergast who will come out and play that kind of uh, play that, you know, corner forward that drifts into space and is able to run at lads a bit more um, from deeper. So I, I think I think the options are an absolute blessing. And I think I take your point about it being maybe difficult to integrate new players in and how it might affect the system a bit. I, I don't think it will. I think they're all him and off or singing off the, the one hymn sheet and like having 24 or 25 players that can actually realistically play a championship for you at a given stage, be it play be it start a game or finish a game or come in for 10 minutes. I think that's huge. You won't get through Munster uh, as attritional as it is without loads of options. And I think they've got plenty of them now. Even Keem Wadding playing yesterday, who I'd heard very, very little of. Okay, he, he didn't have, you know, a massive game or anything like that, but it's a full league game exposure for him. Um, even Jack Fagan at wing back, maybe he won't start championship wing back, uh, but maybe he'll be needed at some stage when somebody goes off uh, with 20 minutes to go and he'll be able to f- fill in kind of seamlessly. So I think having those those options is huge and I think Liam has used the league fairly well and I think he'll continue to use it well and reintegrate players back into the into the fold. Yeah, I, thought, I, think, I, I, I think as well, Michael there, uh, you mentioned it, and Shane, you asked the question about Michael Kiley. I think um, he is a Liam Cal type player. I think Liam Cal does like to play, uh, albeit no different than most teams, the ball has worked around you know, right the way out through the lines, but he does like pumping ball down on top of a, a target man in full forward. And, and at the moment, other than Jack Fagan, Michael Kiley probably is that target man. So I think he is a player that Liam Cal will give every chance to because he likes the he likes the 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 option of having the the direct long ball edge of the square and um, having a target man there as well as obviously a, a dizzy type who 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 will run and use the space in the wings. Yeah, I wonder even with Jack Fagan moving to the backs, even if it is temporarily, is it a view to Limerick? Because in the forwards, he hasn't really had his best games against Limerick. I know he scored a goal in the league game last year when he caught one over Kyle Hayes, but in general, he's had quieter performances against them. Uh, that would just be my take. And for a bit of fun, Fergal, uh, just going to put you on the spot if you don't mind. Uh, it's, it, this has been tough for me now, so I'm going to try and put you on the spot for a minute. What three teams are going to get out of Munster and uh, who's going to be eliminated? All right. <laughs> you didn't team me up for this one, Shane. Uh, you didn't team me up for this one. Uh, look, I think nobody could say Limerick are not going to qualify. You just you just couldn't. Um, yeah. So you have to assume Limerick are a given. Um, I think based on what we've seen so far, uh, I'd like to think Waterford are probably going to be in there as well. And uh, and based on what we've seen so far, but the Cork are always a bit of a. They're 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 a bit of an anomaly at times. Um, my gut feel is it probably will be Cork. 
so Cork, Waterford and Limerick if I was if if if, if I was to nail it now. But I mean Jesus does nothing between you know, clear and, and, and tip if tip get a run. And sometimes, you know, I, I'm not sure guys with this be your experience, but I, I, we've all been involved in teams. I've been involved in teams sometimes whereby, you know, not saying tip or hit and rock bottom, not suggesting that for a second, but when things go against you, I mean, it can be a little bit cyclical like that, whereby when things go against you, you know, particularly our senior players, now you are missing the likes of the, the Park Mars. And the Shamey Cannons, maybe. I know he, he'll hopefully be back, but you know, who'll rally the troops. But sometimes when things are going against you, it really is a time where your leaders dig in and you know and help turn the ship around. And that can happen too. And you can get a you can, you can go on a run. Um so if Tip can do that, and I'm not saying they've hit rock bottom and all the only way is up, it's, it's it's not like that. But by the same token, if um if Tip can can turn this thing a little bit and get some momentum. Jeez, it'd be very hard to write them off. I mean, the monster is impossible to call, but if you have to call it now, I'd say those three limit for sure. Yeah, you, I just cannot see any situation where Limit don't qualify. I think Waterloo will as well, and I think Cork will. But jeez, you'd be a, you'd be a, you'd be a foolish man to write off um, clear a tip as well. It's, it's a monster. It's just a, it's almost a lot. Other than Limerick, I think it's a lottery. But they're the three I'd pick. It's gas yeah. like that. That Easter Sunday kickoff and the the prospect of those games like Limerick. You're you're you think Limerick are going to turn around, but. Limerick go to Parky Cueve the first day out and just say they are beaten, which is not beyond the rounds of possibility. Then they're playing Waterford next time out. So there's a, there's a potential chance that they could be 0 for 2 going into the last two games. I just think it's hugely, it's hugely intriguing and we we all think Limerick are going to bounce back and you expect them to, but it's not it's not a given either. Um, and that Munster is, a, Leinster is a shark tank, but like Munster is probably two or three times worse. Yeah, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. Yeah, that was a terrible one to put you on the spot, but uh, it kind of came to mind. <laughs> I, I could not. And, and you know why he put you on the spot, Fergal? Because it's going to be all over the Tipperary dressing room now. Waterford legend writes off Tip. <laughs> That's all you'll see now for the next six weeks. It'll be nailed, it'll be nailed up in yeah. Watts Park. Uh, Fergal, you, you've been watching, obviously, as ever, you've been watching an awful lot of hurling. And uh, after the Cork uh, Galway game, which finished 126 to the Rebels, 23 points for the, the Tribe, and obviously, tough time for, for Galway, of course, for manager Henry Shefton losing uh, his brother Paul Shefton and deepest condolences to everyone down there in Ballyhale. But uh, you were talking about the game and you were saying there's a little bit of bite gone out of games because we don't have as many balls that's been, you know, tanked up the field in 50 50 contests. So the ball has been moved around laterally and, you know, eventually worked up through the lines. Like, how much do you think it, it, it affects the. Um, the entertainment value or the appeal to people of hurling that the ball has been moved around differently now yeah it's a funny one uh shane because again maybe it's what you grew up and what you're used to and i suppose i loved but if you ask me my favorite time ever for hurling it was probably the mid to late noughties year where that kilkenny even though kilkenny and tip were dominating and probably dominating too much kilkenny in particular and you know you weren't starting it like this year i mean has there ever been a year where you feel it's more open than this year. Only Limerick are still, but of the chasing back, I mean, and as I say, without Kilkenny, Cork and Tip being the obvious three that they have been for a hundred years, um, I mean, it's hugely exciting. But uh, like for me, if I was to look at entertainment value of hurling, I felt that that late noughties was for me. That's a personal choice. It was just it was it was, it was kind of off the cuff stuff. It was massively skillful with the players of the Owen Larkins and Tommy Welsh's and the and the Martin Comfort's, Henry Shefflin's, Eddie Brennan's, all these guys, Parik Mar for tip. It was just for me, that was my favourite time ever watching hurling. Everyone has their preference. My young lad is 14 years of age. This is what he's grown up watching. I mean, you hear people lamenting the, the ground hurling from from a previous era. I mean, I wouldn't lament I if I never saw a ground stroke again, it wouldn't bother me like, right? Because it's just not, I don't see a place for it. It's not something I miss. It's not something you'd say other than maybe, you know, someone an overhead strike for a goal or something like, right? But ground hurling for me, you know, I never lament the loss of that. You know, for me, looking at Galway and Cork at the weekend, now maybe it was a little bit less so on Welsh Park because it's a tighter pitch, but, you know, your ball's been passed laterally, four or five pass over back, a bit more football-esque, um, it seems like there's a bite gone out of it. In Championship, I think, with a bigger crowd there, with more pressure on, I don't think people will be passing the ball as... I mean, it was one or two intercepted even in the Cork Galway game, which led to scores and were overturned. I don't think you'll take the same risk in tight Championship games. And, you know, you will be a little bit more direct. I mean, the tra you know, the, the, there will be people um, say that's a very traditionalist view that we don't like. That. It's the modern game. It's the way it is. Um, it's not going to change. It's not going to go back unless someone finds a better system that's more direct, which... I, I, I think we're going to see more of this. I don't think we're going to see more. You saw the way they stood back off puckouts 
at the weekend and, and I think we're going to see more of that ball goes to fullback cornerbacks laterally across the pitch waiting, waiting, waiting for the right spot the right run and then pick out the precision pass and that is the game but the game has become a mix of absolutely savage tackling and some of the tackling now like when I was playing we were never tackled by three or four players. You were tackled by the man you were marking. And but you, if you bet your man, you usually had a bit of grass in front of you. Now if you bet your man, you're hitting two or three more players and they're coming in swarms to overturn you and whatnot. So there's savage intensity on one end of the game. And yet on another end of the game, you can have a player passing the ball three or four times unmarked, if you like, and looking very casual. And and some of the bite gone out of it. But I do suspect it won't be the same for a championship. Um that you know, you won't see players passing that ball around the back three, four, five passes. You know, I think the pressure alone, you know, players players won't be as inclined to take the risk if you like, you know. But yeah, you know, it's just a it's just a personal preference. As I say, my young lad's fourteen years of age. This is the only hurling he knows really. Um, he probably will see that when he's an adult. As this is the best hurling, you know. This is, I mean, it's the skill levels are just insane. The physicality, the fit. Can you hear Fergal there? It seems to have, it seems to have dropped. Gone. I think someone from Offaly cut him off because he was giving out about ground hurling. Yeah, okay. Maybe Fergal can jump back on there in a second. But yeah, I'm, and I wonder then what's the response going to be from referees and, and so on because we're seeing plenty of, of red cards. I think Barry Heflin is probably very lucky that he didn't get um, a, a red card for, for a high hit. I don't think he went into necessarily do the player i can't remember who exactly he hit it was Stephen that. bennett Shane, and it was yes, it was good to be at the venue just to see the chawn between cattle and bevins and colin bonner and even tommy dunn down the far end that was the only occasion in the game where it got kind of heated and they were giving it hot and heavy because uh the waterford lads obviously weren't happy with the tackle the tip lads i'm sure were saying that the tackle was wasn't that bad or whatever but that was that was i expect that for 75 minutes when the meet in the Munster game. Yeah, yeah, I had to, uh, I'd have to agree with you. Um, so Cork against Galway, um, Patrick Horgan scored one thirteen. Seamus Harnley scored four points, and then there was a couple of points each for Mark uh, Coleman, Robbie O'Flynn, and Shane Barrett, Tim O'Mahony, Darrell Fitzgibbon, and Jeremy Millerick. They also got on the score sheet for Galway um, of their twenty three point tally. Connor Cooney got six frees. Ronan Glenn, and he's a real star turn. He's having a good season. Got five from midfield. Tom Monaghan with four from wing forward. Gavin Lee and Joseph Cooney got a couple each, and then a, f- a few other lads got uh, on the scoreboard also. Fer- Fergal, we lost you there for a second, uh, but uh, yeah, you look seem to be all back and good there now. A question, like, so you're talking about the, the physicality and the hits that are going in. A question I'd have for you then is, like, w- what's the response going to be from the GA and, and referees? Because we're seeing more red cards lately. We were saying Barry Heffernan is quite fortunate that he didn't get red for, for the hit that he put in on Stephen Bennett. And are we going to see more and more red cards? Like with such physicality, there's going to be a duty of care to players. Yeah, but funny enough, um, uh, Shane, I'm not sure is that, for me anyway, is the main issue in the sense that there are a lot of uh, hard hits and heavy hits. But And, and in fairness to Barry Heffern yesterday, I will say, I mean, he got he got Stephen Bennett a fair wallop, all right? Like, but um, I do think... There was an element. I think there was honesty in the intent there. I don't mm. think he went in to hit him in the head with that level of intent, right? I think Stephen Bennett was pulling back, as all good players do, to try and sidestep. And you know, I, I you know, it could have been a red card because he got him in the head and he got him, a, he got him, a, he got him a fair, he got him a fair whack in the head. But I don't think there was intent in it. And you know, Galanz was probably that bit different. All right, there was intent in that. But I mean, you're looking at Jack Brown's last night. Jesus, I. Uh, I know you might say consistent fouling, but ah, oh God, I didn't even think it was a free to be honest. Um, but my, my thing is more so, and I don't think there's a way around this other than leave the game flow a bit. Like, I mean, the, the hits are coming in. The one, the one tackle, by the way, I think is dangerous when a guy is, and we're not clamping down on this, but clamping down on high tackles, which I don't think are really, I've, I've yet to see, I challenge anyone on this, I've yet to see someone being really badly hurt with one of these, you know, so called high challenges, head high challenges. They're, they're generally, to, to, to some extent at least, they're 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 manufactured by the by the attacking player to some extent. They're usually from a stand and still position, and they're not dangerous. They're not like in rugby where they're dangerous tackles. The one that I think is dangerous where the guy is over a ball, roll lifting is say in a ruck, and a guy comes in from the side and gets him on the head. I think they're dangerous tackles that we need to stamp out for sure. But I don't see the others being dangerous. The issue is the swarm tackling. You get a ball in possession. 
and you're being attacked by three or four players. And um, I think that just is what it is, and, and and we have to live with it. I mean, the hand pass is the big the big debate at the moment, and and uh, I think it just needs to be yeah stamped out. I think it's changed the game. The hand pass is allowed. The Limerick have changed the game of hurling, right? And the hand pass in tight quarters at such precision has allowed them to do that. If they couldn't hand pass so precisely under pressure, I mean, they're, they're, they're leaving off passes now to players who are being marked that 10 years ago you wouldn't have dreamed of even trying to pass to that player, but they can do it now because of the precision of the hand pass. And the question is, is it a hand pass? And if it wasn't, if, if, yeah, if they were forced to actually have, a, have a, a, a double action, a real clear double action, um, I don't think they could leave off those passes. So that is actually having an impact on the game of hurling. I'm not saying for the worst, by the way, but ultimately I do think it should be absolutely um, absolutely stamped out. that the, the, the swarm tackling, the heavy hitting and the tackling, as long as it's not dangerous, I don't think there's there's anything we can do about it. And there's nothing wrong with it. I think, you know, um, as you say, you know, the examples of Watford yesterday, I think most crowds, most fans respond positively to that. Yeah, do, Fergal, just before I let, let you go, because I know you have a meeting there, do you think that there's anything that Limerick fundamentally need to change or do you think it's a case that it will come right come championship? Now, Peter Casey has been out injured and he's such a vital man and I think he has a very specific role that not everyone can do, but it seems like there's more at play than just that. Or would you write it off and say they'll, they'll be right when it, when it comes to April? I, I, I think they will be. When you think of the calibre of player and the calibre of setup that they have, I think they will be right come championship. But the only thing I'd say is, I mean, every team... Now, they've done this for the last couple of years and haven't figured out. Every team in the country is trying to figure out how do we stop Limerick. Every team. Any team who has any aspiration to win the All-Ireland is trying to find out, trying to, and they're studying it and they're considering it for the whole winter. How do we stop Limerick? So, Limerick's game plan, which has probably has evolved a bit, but it's been relatively consistent for the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, everyone knows what's going to happen in terms of space going to Galan and he goes left or right. But we haven't been able to stop it. Um... I think teams are becoming better at stopping Limerick, but will it be enough to stop Limerick when they're in full flight? Because they're not in full flight. But if Limerick can reach the heights of last year, uh, and I think they can, I think they can, but if they can reach the heights of last year, I don't see them being beaten. The question is, will they reach those heights? Because what you're going to have is you're going to have other teams probably better prepared this year than ever before to defend against them. Um, and if then Limerick are anyway below where... They have been in the past. If they only read 80% of what they did last year, then they can be beaten. But if they hit their full height, I, I, I can't see anyone stopping them if they hit their full height. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us, Fergal. And look, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but congrats on Bally Gunner winning the All-Ireland Club title. No doubt you celebrated. Probably still are celebrated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had a few hard weekends of it. All right, Shane. But it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, certainly it was, uh, it was just a dream come true on our end. Like It was something that, you know, sure every dream, every, every club dreams of... Um, you know, you don't know. Very few get there, and 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 you don't know if it's ever going to happen. And uh, and uh, it's been a, it's been a good February for sure. Mm, and what a way to do it too. Okay, thank you very much, Fergal, and hopefully we'll be chatting to you again soon. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Fergal. Great to have Fergal on there. Always thinks deeply like about Fergal. the game. You know, he thinks very very deeply about the game. It's great to it's great to get that perspective. I love talking to people who are still playing now, talking to people who are finished maybe 15 or 20 years and getting a different look at it as well. Very, you know, really, really insightful. Yeah, and the big guests are going to keep coming here in our game. And if you want to sign up for the Thursday shows, the only way to see them is on patreon.com forward slash our game. It's just a fiver a month. Works out at about 50 cents over the course of the year per show. And that's not including even all the match reports that you get as well. That will only be on Patreon. Uh, just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgerretro.com. Use the promo code our game and you'll get 15 percent off their fantastic array of jerseys on their website so check it out there now maybe you even want to get this wafford one here uh maybe that cork one over there that's looking so fine on the young lad of the vernies um okay we we didn't fully talk through um cork against galway 126 to 23 points and you know as i was watching the game back i was looking at how cork moved the ball around the field and you know obviously things blew up for them in the all ireland final last year and they got spanked by 16 points but what they're doing is, is something that Kieran Kingston and his coaching team tried to introduce only last year. And remember the league game, they got annihilated by Limerick and people wondered where they're going. But there's there's no way only to persist with this and try and just do it better and, you know, fail better the next time or, you know, hopefully get to a situation from their own point of view where they win. 
and they moved the ball around beautifully yesterday. Galway earned it 100. The players come back. Their manager wasn't uh, at the game for uh, for obvious reasons. So maybe Galway will be better the next day out. But the way they moved the ball through the hands at times was absolutely fantastic. And the conductor of the orchestra is often Mark Coleman back there. Shane Bennett looking really good at centre forward. Dara Fitzgibbon solo through the centre. They have so much pace everywhere. And that's before he put in the wingers, Robbie O'Flynn and Jack O'Connor, arguably the two fastest hurlers in the game. So you can see that huge amount of problems being posed to opposition. And that's before you puck the ball into Patrick Horgan. So early on in the game, Horgan got a point. And in the commentary, I can't remember if it was um, Marty Morrissey or Brendan Cummins who pointed out that Horgan was the only guy inside the 21. And when they showed the replay, I'll just bring it up on screen here. I was just looking at the amount of <clears throat> space that the Cork um, attackers out the field have to play the ball into. Patrick Horgan here on the bottom left of the screen, he's been marked by Dahi Burke. But look at the amount of different directions he can go to if he wants to get on that ball. Or that Jack O'Connor, who delivers the ball in via that yellow arrow, where he can hit the ball if he chooses. And if he sees Horgan get a yard, he hits it in there. And so what chance does Dahi Burke have in that situation? He doesn't really have a chance. That, that's really tough for him. Now, to the, just beneath the start of the right-hand side of the arrow, you can see that's Park Mannion there. I'm pretty sure it's Park Mannion. But being a sweeper, like where does he go? Unless he just stands either side of Horgan on the inside, then I'm not really sure how he can stop a ball going in being effective. So that's the conundrum you have when you're against Cork now. Do you press out and try and stop the supply? Or you sit back and try and make sure there's no one to hit it on the inside to, but then you'll be overrun out the field. Like, it's very tough to stop that. Yeah, they've created the perfect situation. What what does every team want to do? Deny space in their own defence, mm. create space in their own attack. Um, and I think it's fascinating to see there, you, you know, I remember if you look back at the All-Ireland final last year, like Garrod Hegarty in like 40 yards of space, solo and through to score a goal. I think bo both of his goals, he ended up in a massive amount of space. Whereas if you just bring that clip up again, Shane, Cork are in an attacking position, but look how well they're set up defensively. You know, they've got, you know, at least five, probably six players inside the 45 nearly. You know, they're set, they're attacking, but they're set up really, really well defensively. So, you know, if that ball, if that ball does break down, it happened a lot last year that at times they had nearly too many guys committed to the attacking movement. And that's not to say you can't commit lots of guys to an attack. At times you can. You know, if you're running the ball, we'd say through the hand, that's probably when you commit a load of a load of bodies to it because it's moving through the hand off the shoulder. That type of ball is completely different. And you say there, like Patrick Horgan is in complete control there. As long as the ball given into him hits the hits grass, he has, you know, a really, really high percentage chance of winning it. And um that's just refine them refining a plan that was taking shape last year. Probably really malfunctioned in the All Ireland final, but definitely looks like they've honed in on it a bit more. And I think the key thing is we know Cork can hurt teams offensively, no doubt about it. They can, you know, do serious damage and have some of the best forwards in the in the country. But it's can they remain compact in defence? And it definitely looks like they're trying to do that, even while attacking. Mm, yeah, so Horgan's celebration was a message to Shane, I heard. That's one comment in here. Why was Horgan putting his finger um, to his mouth as Fred91? Yeah, who do, you think, uh, who do you think that message was to? Who's questioning him? Wait now. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I don't necessarily think that. It, he's pro I'd say he could be paying homage to someone or it could be even you know he's a big Tom Brady fan it could be I don't know did Tom Brady ever do anything like that I, I, I don't know but I, I'd be very surprised if it was aimed at, aimed at uh, if it was aimed at you now somehow because we've uh, never had anything on the unbelievable uh, time for Horgan but that's, that was I thought there was aspects even of Horgan's play the other night that were different he's obviously we know how good he is up front but I think he's developed into more of a defender um, over the years, like that, like he uh, he took the ball off. I think it was Johnny Cohn at one stage scored a point. He you know pounced on a defensive mistake and was true for. Also, that um, that goal he got is just such a lesson to, to forwards. Get down on the ball, get the ball in your hand straight away, and then the little short and stroke to make sure the defender uh, had no chance. I I think I know you thought maybe that he was going to have to fight for his place a bit more, that maybe Cork were looking at other guys or looking at his successor and that maybe he wouldn't be a starter. I just think it's a case that they've eased him into the league and didn't want to overload him uh, early doors. But he looks 
he looks fairly sharp at the moment, definitely. Yeah, James S says, Sir Saint was calling for him to be benched madness. I never called him for ben, uh, to be benched. I said at the start of the year when he didn't start the first two games, maybe Cork are looking at different options because they know that you know he's been on the road a long, long time. Is he going since 2008, I think, maybe even 2007? That at some point when you're heading for 34, that you'll have to look at other lads and they want to see, do they have them? And I still said, I, did I say something like, I'm still fairly certain, 70% sure that they're going to start him this year. And I was never questioning his class. Just the situation that, you know, maybe. And, like, it's still only league, so you don't know what's going to happen just yet. But certainly in terms of writing him off, go away or that. Sure, how many times have we celebrated him here? Um, PUL74 says, how good will Cork be when teams start tackling them hard and players are fit enough to stay with them? Shadow boxing is nearly over, lads. I wonder is that something that Limerick supporters believe or some... Some of them just hoping that that's the case or, you know, maybe they're 100% right. Well, I think it was uh, very encouraging from a car point of view that, you know, it depends what a, what is thrown up in a given game. Cork knew that they were going to have to be seriously physical to beat Limerick. Uh, in that league game a couple of weeks ago and they were able to get really in their face it's probably something that we hadn't seen from Cork uh, for a good while that wasn't that game the game the other night didn't demand that if you go if you want to if if you want to play an ex- exhibition game against Cork you know it's your own funeral like grand they will beat you nearly nearly every time uh the way to the way if you really want to, to beat Cork he would have said is to get very very physical with them deny them time in the ball be really intense all over the pitch put serious serious pressure on them um deny possession starters and don't let them build up ahead of steam so it, it was kind of strange from a Galway point of view um that the game was allowed to be played that way and be allowed to be played Cork's way uh the other night but to be fair we, we've questioned uh I definitely have questioned Cork's ability to win at this time of the year and their league performances for the last what 24 years nearly and they're in a good position to kind of maybe write that wrong. And I think a league title would mean quite a bit to them as well. There's a couple of teams that a league title would mean a lot to, mean a lot to Waterford, I think, mean a lot to Cork, mean a lot to Wexford too. And they're all in that situation now where they have a chance of winning a league. Um, and like if Cork are a top of the ground team and they're able to win a league and perform as they have done in recent weeks, I think that's nothing only encouraging. And again, I come back to it. If you want to be at that top table you need to be consistent and they have showed a lot more consistency a lot less of those kind of Jekyll and Hyde performances that we that always had me been a doubt in Thomas about Cork in the last couple of years whereas they're slowly kind of eroding that away now yeah James S and I think this is relating to the live chat that's going on on YouTube at the moment the hate for Limerick here even when the topic moved off them is relentless so I'm curious do people like is there a sense that people have it in for Limerick and look you and I have said this before like we're not going to shy back from criticizing like if there is a red card tackle or you know heavy tackling or whatever but we we never kind of hold back when we're praising them either with the quality of their hurling and what they've done so we're always trying to find that balance and richard hogan says galway have serious physicality but they do lack pace and defense matched up well with limerick but struggle against wexford and cork by the way cork have a huge advantage playing in the park different to wexford park um so obviously it's wexford and cork who are both qualified directly into the into the semi-finals now and their last game is going to be a bit of a dead rubber but it's the first time the cork have won four league games in a row since 2005 17 miles from galway obviously that that uh, kind of killed their chances of working their way back into the game uh, midfielder ronan glennon brother of davy who of course has gone on to play with westmead in recent times five points from midfield i mean he is a common talent so that's one real bright spot for them Definitely, uh, and even I thought Tom Monaghan's performance was was, an, was another mm. bright spot too. Uh, there was a great clip shown last night where uh, he had made a run down the far sideline, and like me, you, or most other people would have just not would have been out of the play as a result of making a run like that kind of a lung burst and run. The ball was kind of overturned. I think it was Cottle Mannion picked it up, and all of a sudden, who was running off his shoulder again and ready and willing to break the tackle again on only Tom Monaghan so there's definitely a few of the younger guns uh, have shown shown up well even Jack Hastings at time in, in attack at times an attack has shown up as well uh, as you say Ronan Glennon very very good too so you know at least we have a fair idea what we're going to get out of Cottle Mannion, Parik Mannion, Dottie Burke and these guys come championship it's the new faces that we probably need to see a lot more of and we, we, we've seen we've seen a bit probably Glennon and I'd say Tom Monaghan are probably the two that have stood up and you know, if those two 
fit into a fit, fit into a championship team and kind of plug holes maybe that had been there in recent years, um, I think it'd be that'd be hugely beneficial. And like Waterford beat Galway last year to me in the engine room and beat them with energy in around the middle of the field. And I think um that was probably the sword that Shane O'Neill fell on. And I don't think Henry's gonna fall on that this time. They're gonna get bodies that can really get up and down the pitch and can go and go and go and go. And Glenn and Amon and definitely look like two lads that can do that. Hmm. Let us know out there, people. Do you think Cork can go on and win the All Ireland this year? Do you see Galway getting out of Leinster? Who do you see getting through both provinces? Who's gonna be knocked out? Um we have a comment in from Patrick Coleman on YouTube. He says, uh, this was after the Kikenny Dublin win. Or sorry, Kilkenny's win in Dublin, 223 to 16 points, really, really comprehensive. He says, anyone not counting Kilkenny as all Ireland final contenders would be foolish. Right now, it's number one Cork, two Waterford, three Wexford, four Kilkenny after the weekend matches. Limerick just don't look like they're going to turn it around in time. Very low scoring in every game and none of their top players are going well. Now, James S replied, shock and comment on Limerick over a month and a trashing of Offaly will, will happen in between. So, do you know what? I, I wanted to bring up a, a clip here. Now, this is from... Owen Larkin, who joined us on the Thursday show, which is only available on patreon.com forward slash our game, five a month. But um, I was asking him about Kilkenny and their approach this year. Now, obviously, this is before the Dublin game, but he said there's not one fix to catch Limerick, and he was talking also about uh, Kilkenny's setup. So here's just a little minute clip from that. I, I think there's not one fix to, you know, catch Limerick. I think if you're going to be Limerick, I think they will need to mix it up, you know, long ball and short ball, and because... Obviously, teams are studying other teams now. You know, it's it's gone crazy. So, um, like if, if Kilkenny go all short, Limerick will just they'll they'll zone in on that and they'll know what to do. So I think they do need to mix it up a good bit. Do they have the players to do that? Time will tell, I suppose. Um, but look, definitely they are trying to they're trying to go a little bit more short as it is. Um, but like I said, the players will dictate what way you play. Um, and I think that's what Brian is trying to, he's trying to suss out, you know, do we have the players, you know, that we can bomb high balls in? A, um, obviously, TJ will be an option, although I did hear today he's he's going for a grain operation when he comes back from his honeymoon, so that's another little while out. Uh, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I did hear it. Um, that's going to be another while out, but look, um, have we players that are able to win their own ball and puck outs in the half hour line? Maybe that's the reason for Park Welsh there. Um, against Tipperary, you know, trying to suss out options. Yeah, and Paraguay scored four points from play against Dublin the other night. Had quite enough for the first part of the game, but he really came into it. Just going to go through a few more comments here, Michael, and then we'll talk a bit more about Kilkenny's very impressive win over Dublin. Kieran Fenley, can we say that Kilkenny are definitely the best team in Leinster and that two in a row wasn't a fluke of Leinster titles? Looking forward to the show as usual. That Don't think we ever that. said the two in a row was a fluke now, to be fair. No, but they, I suppose I suppose what he's par like maybe paraphrasing is just the whole notion that that Kilkenny are a little bit off it. Okay, f fair point, but I, I wouldn't say that like neither of the wins were a fluke, but like they're they are they are off it to me at all Ireland level. But Leinster to me, Leinster is the weaker of the two provinces. And they they could still win Leinster, but you know, could Kilkenny win Munster? I'll put it to you that way. Yeah, well, this this is the thing, probably not. Wouldn't it be on. great to mix a match and like if Kilkenny were in Munster next year? And like I'm, I'm just saying from a hypothetical point of view of uh, even rankings in the country and seeing like like if Kilkenny were in uh, Munster for the next five years, would they get to an All Ireland semi final? Do you know what I mean? They're just because they'd have to beat X, Y, and Z to get there. It's never going to happen, but it's a, it's a fascinating, it'd be fascinating kind of uh, permutations. Yeah, Patch, uh, Patch Cab one says Limerick won't get out of Munster. Um, SSRI says the way the game is evolving, Cork look the most likely to win it. TVPC says Limerick are a dirty team who cry if you point out they're swinging at heads every game. Could you forgive Galway for not being in the pitch of the game on Saturday? Um, uh, uh, Ronan uh, Rowan would have found it difficult to take charge of that team. Sorry, Richie O'Neill. Sorry, yeah, that could have been the reason, and uh, it'd be interesting to see if they can bounce back. Kilkenny were robbed by a referee last year's semi-final loss in extra time. Uh, another comment in here, Shane, do you know if Tim uh, Tom Phelan pulled a hamstring given the way he was taken off? Joe Butler, one of our other viewers, should be proud of three O'Loughlin Gale backs on Saturday evening. Kilkenny could have been playing on a motion. RIP to Paul Shefflin. Obviously, we echo that. Yeah, Tom Phelan seemed to just... Uh, I wasn't entirely sure what sort of a, a leg injury, but he definitely limped off as the game went on there. 
Connor Prunty uh, went off yesterday with a hamstring as well, which Liam Cattle said would probably Declan be. Declan lim- limped yeah. off for Limerick. Not, so, not, gr- not. Well, it could be worse timing. It'd be worse to get it in the last round and be two weeks on and be really under pressure. Like Shamie, Shamie Callan's under pressure now, probably to make Munster after breaking a finger last Friday night too. Um, yeah, not, not, not probably great timing to be honest with you. Uh, and as we said before, a muscle injury. Muscle injury the week before the Munster or Leinster Championship could see you miss nearly the whole provincial campaign. That's just how condensed it is. That's the way it is. Yeah, Fergus Butler says, Congrats to the Owen Rule Camogues on winning the Junior Camogie All Ireland in Drada. Ireland hockey captain Katie Mullen with the winning gold up the rose. Read that the other day. Yeah, there was actually an interview with her in Saturday's paper. It's um, some uh, listen when they talk about sports correlating over hockey and hockey and hurling are similar. She would have definitely hockey and hurling definitely in the nineties would have probably been have more similarities. But uh, it's a fair achievement to be able to mix two sports like that and fair play to her getting an all Ireland at the weekend. Yeah, I was quite impressed with um, with Wex or Kilkenny. I had to say at the weekend they were very good. Um, not everything went their way during the game, and like Dublin were poor. Uh, Matty Kenny said it himself. The team was really flat. And if you look, if you're looking at the team in terms of physicality, they didn't have Liam Rush there. They didn't have Owen O'Donnell there. Dara Gray's been out for a few games now. These are three very solid physical lads. Then if you go back to the Leinster final last year, Keen Boland, Mark Shute, and Keen O'Sullivan all started. All of them, they weren't available either. So they're definitely down a few players, but you still can't write off what Kilkenny did in this game. Because, you know, when Dublin made a bit, a bit of a burst by getting the first three points in the second half, and there is that slight hill in Parnell Park, and you really feel it when you're playing it, especially if you're a back facing and puck outs, it's lovely. The ball hangs in the air, and you can really attack it by going downhill. But um, they responded and took over. Wally Walsh and Mossy Keown got the goals. Uh, Mossy Keown set up the first one also by snaffling a breaking ball, and Wally Walsh just thrashed it to the net. So they finished really well, and Dublin, you know... <sighs> It was just really poor, out of sorts performance that I wasn't expecting with just 16 points. But I came around to thinking afterwards, like, is it is there something here where we've been talking about Dublin having more hurlers in the team, the likes of Connor Burke and, and Donald Burke and Ronan Hayes and really good lads and they're all well able to compete. But it is the point that in the past, when Dublin were considered this big physical team, sort of a lot of gym bunnies in there, this, this is how it would have been said. I would have never regarded them, uh, you know, in that way. But that they're not quite as, you know, physical as they might have been in before. So therefore, Parnell Park, the tighter confines, mightn't actually suit them the way it would have in the past. Yeah, maybe they're more kind of ball players now, maybe, and the the way they play with a lot of sharp passing, and they they overdid it the other night. And I thought some of the passing was a bit over, over the top. They weren't necessarily even giving the ball to a man in in a better position at times. But it, I probably agree with you. Um. Kilkenny are always going to be physical. That's just the nature of them. And they're probably they're gonna they would out muscle a lot of teams on a given day, but they were definitely able to out muscle uh Dublin the other night and they were able to kind of they didn't really give them much space to operate in. Parnell is is you know significantly tighter than, than most grounds in the country, particularly uh Parky Cueve, Crow Park and Semple Stadium. And you know, I wouldn't yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it suits Dublin the way they're playing now and the type of player that they have. Another thing as well, I, I couldn't get over how like Donald Burke to me is an absolute killer up front and he was just way too far back to pitch for me. He was picking up balls on the 21 yard line around 30 yards from his own goals at the time. And to me, like he, he should never be hitting the ball to somebody else to put it over the bar. Somebody should, should be giving it to him. And I think, I think if that's one thing Matty Kenny might have learned from the other night is I do think he has to be, um, a lot further up the pitch. I know he can score from deep, but that's that's his own 65 up. I just thought he was way too deep the other night. And even at times, Danny Sutcliffe was picking up the ball in really, really deep positions. Um, I'm not saying they have to be really far up the field, but I just think they, their positions need to be a bit more advanced. And I thought they shot themselves in the foot a bit in that respect. Yeah, I mean, there's a fair point on that, but you do need half forwards who can score, which will force you know, the half-backs to be drawn out the field. So I'd imagine there's a bit of a thought process in that. And also because of some of the players that they're missing, Keno Sullivan had been used in the half-hour line in some of the earlier games that I'd seen, including the Walsh Cup. So maybe there's an element of there's players out. Dublin have only used, I think, 23 players, 22 players in the league compared with Kilkenny's 29. So maybe they're making do to some degree. Another point that stood out, and 
because of the players that I talked about being absent, maybe there's a bit of a needs must at the moment, but I'm just not quite sure that Paddy Smith is suited to play in at centre-back. We, we rate him highly. We've talked about him a lot, um, and I've seen him play for Clontarf. Really, really good player. I've seen him in close quarters. He's a monster. But And he did a great job on, on um, wasn't it, on TJ Reid in the Leinster final last year, and not many can do that. So, look, we built him up enough to be able to make a, a, a tactical point here. I'm just not sure, sure he's suited to number six. Because number six, you need a guy who's like, his hand is a Venus flytrap to snap any ball that's coming his way. And then he's able to hurl it in any any direction. And I just think he's more suited to being a stopper than, you know, a smooth center back who's going to sort of drive you forward out the field, be a threat going the other way. So I think that's something that's also not quite working for them. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with you. I, I, I do think he's, I do think he's very, very good man marker, very, very sticky, won't give, uh, usually an opposition a corner forward that he usually be on will give him very little time in the ball. But centre back's a completely different position. Like, look at the way De- Declan Hannon plays centre back. Um, it's all about distribution. It's all about positioning. It's all about how good you are in the ball. His ability to strike over a ball from eight or ninety yards left or right, give lovely ball inside, burst forward when he gets a chance. And you know, with due respect to Paddy Smith, I just don't think playing him centre back is is playing to his strengths. And you might say, it, as you said there, it might be a needs must at the moment. But I like I don't think that's a long term solution. I think it's a short it's a short term solution. Um, maybe if Dara Gray was fit, he probably maybe would potentially slip in centre back. Um, Liam Rush, obviously, we haven't really seen Liam Rush this year, have we? No, we no. haven't. I'm not yeah. sure if I've seen him even at all. Yeah, so that's obviously a bit of a worry, given that they're only what they must be only six weeks away from from playing championships. So yeah. that is definitely a worry because. Uh, up until last year, injuries had been a kind of a regular thing with him and he got a good clean run last year and was able to stay fit the whole way through. So that's a bit of a worry. And listen, maybe Matty Kenny knows something there that, that we don't and they're trying to find some sort of a, a long-term solution. Just wouldn't be sure if, if Paddy Smith is, is it. I, I think he's much more suited to playing in the corner. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd agree on that point. And I'm just looking over my notes from the match here and I was thinking at the start of the game, I wrote down... Uh, saying this is a big opportunity for Killian Buckley who started and seems to be playing wing forward but dropping into midfield at times and I would have thought I would have thought that it'd be probably the last place he'd play but he was very quiet for the first half but as the game wore on he was quite good and I think Wally Walsh by scoring 1-3 he's after laying down a little bit of a marker this year Martin Keown continues his good form he was playing full forward Park Walsh I actually had a note written here midway through the second half that he's been pretty quiet but he still ended up with four <laughs> points from play. So, and yeah. you've already mentioned David Blanchfield. He scored three from wing back. Mikey Carey came forward for a score. And th- this is a running team now with uh, the Kilkenny that their half backs are scoring and contributing. So, Keen Kenny again, he did some nice stuff there. There's, there's a lot of good about this Kilkenny team. But again, you know, it is the weaker side of the league. We haven't seen them play. Um, we haven't seen them play Waterford just yet. What way will Waterford be humming going into that forward, or that final game? You know, if you look at the Division 1B, it's Watford 7 points, Kilkenny 6, Dublin 5, Tipperary 4. So things can change around a little bit in the last day. Like, where do you think uh, Kilkenny are at in the overall scheme of things? We can be quite reactionary and say, oh, we were completely wrong with our power rankings. But maybe, you know, maybe it's just a bit too early to say they did lose to Tipperary. Yeah, it's yeah that that form doesn't work out particularly well. And to be honest with you, I was putting a good bit a good bit of stock in that. In that, you know, I, I probably wouldn't rate Tipperary too highly at the moment. And yesterday, maybe confirmed that. And uh, I kind of thought Kilkenny were a step behind them, and that's why I kind of I rated them as such. Um, it's going to be interesting. They're going to be getting Owen Cody back into the fray, Adrian Mullen back into the fray, uh, Dara Carpen over the over the next couple of weeks. I'm um, sorry to jump in, but actually, didn't didn't Liam Cahill make that point to you about they've been with the club for a long line, long time now? It's not going to be just simple to just jump back into intercounty. And even Owen Larkin there suggested that TJ might have to get an operation. Yeah, no, de- definitely not. Um, it's funny though, being on being on the easier side of the league probably affords them a bit more of an opportunity to actually maybe not parachute them in back into games as quick and maybe get like they basically have to do a preseason in the space of about three or four weeks. That that's it, and they need to get a, a, a plenty of kind of hard running, hard running going. You're basically going from one one season to the next. But like if you look at them, if you look at them the other night, I just. 
you know, I just thought the energy of it all uh, from Kilkenny was brilliant the other night. Totally just sucked the life out of Dublin. Now, how many times they were able to keep kind of breaking Dublin down in around that kind of middle third, particularly when Dublin were going forward, they were able to force a fumble or just put that bit of pressure on and get a, get a turnover. Very encouraging, as you said, to see to see Wally going really well again. Uh, interest as well. We have still haven't seen Richie Hogan. Don't think he's been named in a match day twenty six yet. Um, so I don't know if it's just a matter of making sure that he's available for championship games again. Uh, but it's good to see the likes of the likes of Keane Kenny um, kind of excelling. Even though I think he went off with a with a bit of a knock the other night. Hugh Lawler uh, was very good once once he got into the game after the first ten or fifteen minutes. Do it the other night again. David Blanchfield um, was brilliant again, and it looks like not that necessarily saying that he'll nail down a place, but looks like he'll he'll be playing Leinster Championship this year, be it starting or coming coming off the bench. So they probably have developed um they probably have developed plenty of options for later on in the year. Are they quite up to the level of the top two or three in Munster? I still don't think so. But this they'll still have another good shot at, at winning Leinster with looks of things. And I think I think they put down a nice marker for when they play Dublin later on in the year again. I think that game is in Parnell, uh, to the best of my knowledge, isn't it? I think it is. Um, when they played them in Leinster later on in the year. And just funny enough, Shane, it was just uh, when we were talking about uh, Limerick going to Cork for the first round of Munster, like that game is even more significant because that's own that's Cork's only home game in Munster with the with the Ed Sheeran concerts. So like if they're targeting any one game, it's that game. So I just think it's going to be fascinating. And you know, there's a couple of couple of commenters saying in there that, that Limerick won't get out of Munster. I don't see that happening, but if they lose the first game, very, very interesting. I don't think we've I don't think we've I don't think we've ever probably looked forward to a Munster and Leinster Championships as much as this. And it's three years since the round robin, uh, since the round robin was brought in. And I think again it'll be totally justified that this was 100% the right move to make this switch up in the provinces because it's so intriguing. Everyone plays each other and the most consistent team over four or five games gets out and it's, yeah, it's going to be brilliant. Yeah, Kilkenny, all, two tw- all of their 2-12 in the second half came from play, which is impressive. Really liked the way that John Donnelly, when he broke onto that puck out to set up the second goal, which is for Martin Keown, that he sensed what was coming and that there was the opportunity there and he just... He just took that opportunity. I thought that was very good. Like Dublin, the final moments of the game against, well, the final minutes against Tipperary, Tip had 13 of the last 14 shots and obviously didn't convert them, so therefore deservedly lost the game. But if you're to continue on the trend here, Dublin had a run, I think, between the second minute and 27th minute where they only just got a couple of points. They missed they missed something like seven out of eight scoring chances otherwise. Um, well, sorry, yeah, obviously they did miss six out of eight. And then the second half, after getting it back to 11 points to eight, Kilkenny just completely took over and they ended up scoring, I think it was 2-4 to a point, you know, to completely take over the game. So therein will be a couple of the concerns you'd have for them. Um, but anyway, look, it's early enough in the year and the comments are flying in and keep them coming and let us know what you think. Uh, Ed Sheeran might get a game uh, full forward for Tip if he hangs around. <laughs> Go right there. Uh, Robert Muldoon. Danny Sutcliffe had an awful time in Blanchfield and was getting very frustrated until he picked up a few loose points near the end. Uh, I thought he's had some very good games um, heading into the into this. Uh, could be a difficult year for Tipperary supporters, says Declan O'Keefe. Dublin hit a lot of first, a lot of bad first half whites, which didn't help them. Similar to Tip yesterday when they were chasing game, real killers, especially when opponents are hitting the target. Right. Well, let's talk about Clare and Limerick uh, and that game. So as we were, you said at the top of the show, and I put a note here, a weird sentence. All-Ireland champions Limerick will have to avoid defeat to Offaly in two weeks' time to escape a Division One relegation playoff. Now, it seems unthinkable that they wouldn't. Best will in the world, Offaly just seem a nice bit off it at this level, and it's kind of something that Michael Fenley touched on, and we'll talk about a little bit later on. But Clare, they, they probably should have won this game. I mean, Tony Kelly had five, seven wides. Dermot Burns, who was, gave a leader's performance, he had five. That disallowed goal um, in the first half was completely wrong. I mean, it's easy yeah. to say it here, but Shane Meehan won a ball brilliantly, put it across for Davy Fitz. It was in the back of the net. I mean, you need to, like you were saying, you have to be sure if you're going to make that call. Well, the thing about a square ball is, is that it has to be your first instinct 
he was in the, or you know it has to be a first thing or you saw him in the square it can't be or oh, was he in the square looked like he was in an advanced position it can't be any, any element of doubt to make a big call like that like that was a game changer there's no point in saying any different and when you look back at the footage it it clearly shows that the ball was in the square before David Fitzgerald was and uh, I thought it was good it was good to see him back to kind of full fitness as well um hitting a couple of good points from distance and carrying ball like like only he can uh, there was lots of bright spots from a Clare point of view uh Shay Mean obviously who set up that goal looked very very dangerous uh left Declan Hannon for dust for that goal as well and and won a couple of good balls against the head when it was two on one even in defense up, up over a good score I remember in in the in the first half um so like I think there were yeah fair enough Claire hit a lot of wides but I think there was a lot of promise there uh, maybe more than we had seen in the league thus far and I think they'd be quite happy the like guys said to you on the Thursday show that like they were beaten by nine points when they played Limerick in that Munster League final they drew with them here they're going to play them again there in the Munster Championship you know there's a nice little bit of confidence from a, a you know a recent meeting with them at the same grounds. And it's gas. You look back to that Munster League final, you know, Limerick had a shell of a team, one by nine, Clare had quite a strong team. Then you just throw Tony Kelly back into the mix and it's just like everybody is a foot taller almost on the Clare team, just knowing that, you know, if we can get the ball to him and create scoring opportunities for him, we're going to give ourselves uh, a really, really good chance. I think it's hard to get away though, Shane, from, you know, you know, there are mounting questions over Limerick, I would say. So if you look at Seamus Flanagan picked up a two match ban for the sending off for the sending off against Cork. So he won't play a competitive game. Uh Barron, they're in a relegation playoff. He won't play a, a competitive game from last week all the way to April seventeenth. Far from ideal. Aaron Galam was sent off the other day and you know you'd have to say rightly sent off there's absolutely no excuse for pulling the second time pulling the first time okay the ball is in the vicinity pulling the second time no so that's Galan, Flanagan and Gerard Hegarty three forwards who have all been sent, who've been sent off in consecutive games that's definitely a worry as well then you're looking at you know their scoring averages averaging 16 points coming into last weekend you know 18 points last Sunday um how many goals have they scored in this year's league? Didn't score one against Wexford, didn't score one yesterday, scored one thirteen against Cork, and I can't 11 remember. Points against Wexford? Yeah. So like it's okay if you're not hitting green flags, if you're putting up you know the 27, 28 points that they were putting them up, but they're not putting them up now. I just I just don't think it's as easy as saying the switch is gonna flick. I just don't think it's that easy. Now we did hear uh, from a reliable source that they trained last Saturday and last Sunday, Sunday morning before the Cork game, uh, which would maybe explain some flatness. And they're in a very, very heavy training load. And I believe they're off to Portugal um, for a training camp in the next month as well. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uncharacteristic things happening. And you'd have to have that little bit of doubt in your head. Of the teams that have played four league games at all, across the divisions at the moment, the only teams who have scored less than Limerick, who have scored, if you convert goals to points, 66 points, are Wicklow, one of your former teams with 62. Uh, that's in Division 2B. We'll go down to Division 3A. Louth have scored 64. Monaghan have scored 56. Warwickshire have scored 49. And then if you go beneath that, there's teams that have played three and four games. Obviously, look, we're, we're not comparing them to any of those teams. They've won three All-Irelands in four years. They're unbelievably dominant. But, like, the point you make about the likes of Flanagan not being there at the moment, he'll probably hit the ground running. Like, he's obviously an excellent player. Should have been in the hurler of the year running last year. Um, Peter Casey being out's a big one. It's a big ask for Cahill O'Neill and Adam English to come in and be brilliant players. Obviously, I saw very close quarters last week with the UCD uh, freshers how good this they, they are going to be. But can they go step straight into the team this year? Maybe Cahill O'Neill can, because he showed at times, even like go back to the Galway game when he got fourth in play, maybe they can. But like, there are definitely sort of issues here. And you know what? There's comments coming in too. And, and you know, not everyone is going to agree with these and Limerick supporters might be too happy. But lads, not trying to pick fellas out, but the Limerick lads are a disgrace at the moment in terms of red cards. How Galan didn't see a straight red for the swing yesterday is beyond me. Now, I think second yellow was probably about right. Didn't make contact, but I suppose if you're being te uh, technical about it, an attempted strike is also a red card out there. 
Uh, Trump's bailer was gassy in the rain and hurled her the year, misplaced in an awful attempt at a hand pass at Ennis yesterday. It's great the refs are pulling up on the hand pass. Limerick seems flummoxed. But anyway, did, just on did, that, Shane, I think that's a really good point. I do think that has knocked him out or stride. The really quick hand passing, uh, that's just fluid motion, bang, bang, bang. Everything moves 100 miles an hour. And they're being pulled now. And not even they're being pulled, but there's the element of doubt now. And it's just taken an extra little second. They actually have to think about what they're doing now, whereas they wouldn't. it would have been seamless before this, maybe. And, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that Groot Hegarty and Darrow Donovan, two lads in that sort of midfield engine room, were taken off in the final quarter when the game was there to be won and lost. I thought that was... That kind of stood out to me, I have to say. Now, John Kiley, he talked about the red card incident. So, Aaron Galan getting two yellow cards. I'm not entirely sure what the first one was about. It seemed to be an off-the-ball incident. I didn't quite catch what it was for. But he, Kylie said, had the referee run in and told the players to get up off the ground, it would have been more appropriate. I don't think that was a serious misdemeanor at all. Now, I'm wondering to myself, is this the right attitude to have when, like, you know what I mean? I don't know what view he had of it. Uh, I don't think Conor Cleary was ever going to be killed from that strike because it didn't seem to make much contact with him. But if you swing at a lad generally they're going to make something of it, rightly or wrongly. You know, we've seen that in the, in the past couple of years, and sometimes you're sent off, and sometimes, like, as Aaron Glad found out in the Leinster final, last, or Munster final last year, you don't get sent off. But by John Kiley almost excusing it, is he almost opening up the door for more of that happening from his team and more lads potentially getting red cards for doing stuff that he sees as not a serious misdemeanor? Yeah, well, um, I know he retracted the comments after, but the comments he made after the Galway game last year were kind of that some Galway players were going to ground kind of too easily. So, like, you know, there's it's kind of essentially saying saying something similar there. Um, well, I, I have to agree with you. Like, it was to me, it was a definite second of yellow, second yellow, possibly a red, but de- a definite second yellow. And I just have to say, Shane, uh, the Jack Kelly sending off for for leash have to give give credit to the Antrim fella. That he that he hit, he like hit him straight. Him. He hit him straight in the chest, and he um your man never flinched. He was just like, well, like what's going on here? He didn't go to ground or anything like that. To me, that that's the way any sort of those incidents should be dealt with. And I don't like to see lads going down or anything like that. I don't like to see the Hollywood element of, of that. But um, I do. I thought I think it is peculiar that that Kylie is more questioning. Well, the one thing I'd say is he will not throw his own players under the bus at all. So maybe this is an alternative way of, rather than maybe he is frustrated with Galan. Um, and based on this year's performances, he'd have every reason to be. But he, the one thing he does, he does not throw his players under the bus and never has. Yeah. Water breaks are another one that Limerick seems to be missing. I mean, on the sideline, genuinely, you do want a water break at times. If players aren't doing what you'd hope they'd done or if the other team throws something at you that you weren't expecting, you really would like the water break. That doesn't mean that Limerick are different to anybody else, but just maybe they're better at using it because, you know, it does seem to be a collection of marginal gains for Limerick get ahead. And, like, please don't conflate that with me saying they're not a, a brilliant team and haven't been for the last four or five years. They're absolutely brilliant. But, you know, those points have to be made at the same time. Just, uh, that, just another one, Shane, as well. Teams are letting Limerick ha- have the puck out now. It's it's yeah. funny. It's funny. It's funny to see it. Like um, they're letting them have it, and it's peculiar to see the Limerick lads just driving ball down. Uh, Barry Nash did it a couple of times. Uh, Dan Morrissey did it yesterday as well. Teams are just retri- basically Cork did it last week. Uh, Clare did it yesterday. They're retreating to the forty-five. They're letting Limerick have the puck out rather than and they're the opposition team is basically flooding that half-forward midfield area. There's nowhere for Nicky Quaid to actually hit the ball at the moment where they have a realistic chance of winning it. So I think it's going to be fascinating to see. It looks like teams, most teams that play Limerick are going to do that now. So you have to try and turn what is a disadvantage for Limerick now into an advantage. So can they work the ball to can they work the ball to a Dermot Burns character at the 45 and can he put a ball over the bar, which will all of a sudden push the opposition up? I just I think it's going to be fascinating to see how they try and turn that minus into a plus. Yeah, um, Sherp2U1 says, I'm not a fan of the Limerick style of play. They've won a lot, but the style of play is not my cup of tea. I think that style of play is going to become how everyone plays to, to a certain degree. And even Fergal Hartley, if you missed the start of the show, Fergal Hartley was brilliant talking about all this stuff. And he was suggesting that might be the way for a lot of teams, if I can paraphrase him. That's the coin says, uh, John Kiley's attitude is all wrong regarding red cards. These red cards could cost him in the future. 
Kieran Fennelly adds, Clare should have won, I thought. Limerick are not creating the same scoring chances, much less converting them. A lot of poor whites from far out. You still need to be using your inside forward. So we even talked last week about how Limerick's creation in the All-Ireland final last year was 60 chances, and it was around half that in their game last week. Another point, you talked about those puckouts with Clare, and there was one that really caught my eye at one stage. Every Clare player was outside the 45 as Limerick worked out a short one. And look, maybe this was accident or design, but what seemed to me to me was that they were just going to choke up the middle. So, you know, in the past we've seen Declan Hannon or Nash or whoever comes out with the ball, does a stick pass in and around their own 65. Somebody does a hand pass to a player coming off the shoulder and then they're up in motor and then they're running in past midfield and they play a lovely ball in. But it seemed to me that the middle was choked up and the space was left on the far wing. If you want to do the two or three passes across the field, stick pass or hand passes, to get it out there, you can. But we're just not offering you the centre. So you can have all the 45, you, can, you can't have the middle, and you can have the wings. And it's obviously very difficult to penetrate a team with a stick pass from the wings. So I think that's the template we're going to have now, that it's not going to be a case of even leaving two lads inside the 45 and trying to shepherd and show the wing, you know, I mean, attackers. It's not going to be just everybody drop out. And if I was playing against uh, Limerick, God, I wouldn't blame any team for doing that. No, no, definitely not. Like you're, you're trying to um, see. The thing is, as well, right? Limerick don't have those inside forwards now. They don't have Peter Casey at the moment, and even they don't have Seamus Fanning. Didn't have Seamus Fanning in yesterday, and not going to have him the next day as well. So Limerick's threat inside is not what it once was. So it's kind of, as you said, I don't know if it's by design or not, but Limerick are shooting from out the field a good bit more, uh, partially because maybe they want to. Also partially because the opposition is forcing them to as well. So if I have to say, fair play to you know different management teams and backroom teams that are coming up with ways to stifle them because they've definitely worked so far. Will Limerick be able to uh, work it out and change what they're doing and basically uh, you know have teams showing them the blueprint for what they're going to do against them maybe later in the year? Maybe. And it's going to be fascinating to see how, you know, Paul Kinnerk, John Kiley, uh, Angus O'Brien, Alan Cunningham and all these lads, Donald O'Grady, try and come up with something um, basically to blow that out of the water. Yeah, and I felt that Limerick were targeting this game. The amount of fist pumping being done when they won freeze and stuff like that, especially in the first half, that to me said, this team wants to, to get a win here. Uh, for Clare, Tony Kelly, he scored eight points, or sorry, eight points from freeze, 11 in total. David Fitzgerald scored a couple and obviously could have had a goal too. Colin Malone, really impressive. Shane Meehan, I liked Ryan Taylor's running. I thought he was good. Ryan Mounsey was good. Jason McCarthy getting stuck in around the middle of the field. Um, what what did what I would wonder with Claire is, you know, in the modern game now, you need your wing backs to be starting attacks all the time. And this is a big question I had in the last few weeks with Tipperary. When you went to the Dublin game and you took out Barry Heffernan from one wing and Dylan Quirk from the other, the two lads who had been carrying all the ball from the back in the previous weeks and you took them out, you know, was that the reason that Tipperary's running game just all of a sudden seemed to disappear against Dublin? Maybe it was down to the opposition, I don't know. But uh, I, don't, I don't think it necessarily plays to the strengths of Jack Brown being wing back for Clare or at the other side, David McInerney. They both seem to want to deliver the ball. <clears throat> now, Dermot Ryan will come back in and there might be places for those two lads that I've named in other positions. But that, that was the thing that stood out to me. Obviously, McInerney's injured a lot in general, and he was only just back into the team. And I think Jack Brown, you know, the red card aside, I think his decision-making on the ball isn't always great. Sometimes he puts snow on it. Sometimes he, he coughs it up. So I think that's something that Clare will have to work on if they're going to make an impact in Munster. No, without without without. you. Yeah. By the way, John Conlon was brilliant. Yeah, John Conlon was very good. Um, saw the Sparrow Lachlan saying last week that he was worried about the the conveyor belt of talent, conveyor belt of talent in defence, not an attack. And you would have to agree. But saying that, the full back line I think is 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 solid enough. With like Rory Hayes is as good a corner back as mm-hmm. there is. Connor Cleary's an effective full back. Paul Flanagan's kind of come into his own the last couple of years. Just probably in that half back line where not that there'd be a bit of worry, but like was John Conlon going to be a forward this year? And then all of a sudden they realised that they needed him back centre back. Uh, David McInerney is fit is you know a phenomenal player just it's a matter of keeping him fit Dermot Ryan there as well um, yeah to just be that that would be the line you'd probably be most worried about and it's probably the line that you know, most teams are going to go after I'd say against them they probably won't get too much inside but they could get a bit of joy off that half back line yeah and we don't know how much training these teams are doing I mean Keane Lynch was down twice and you wondered 
you know, has he just been going through a heavy load recently? He was obviously with NUIG, maybe he's in, you know, being trained the legs off at the minute. Obviously, I mean, in a responsible way. Declan Hannon limping off, not ideal. They tried Tom Morrissey inside at times. Don't think maybe it was the ball wasn't coming in. I'm not entirely sure. Adam English scored one of those text point over, textbook over the shoulder points during the first half. Did it a few times as I saw for the freshers last week. Really good. Be interesting to see if, if he steps into the team uh, this year. So anyway, look, we've talked a lot about Limerick and uh, plenty about Clare there also. What about Wexford beating Offaly 122 to 212? Wexford heading for the semi-finals. Offaly looks certain to head for a relegation playoff with Antrim, assuming results go as expected. So Rory O'Connor, he scored nine frees, two lovely points from play and got the game, got a brilliant goal just before half time. Luke O'Connor scored a 47-minute penalty to put Offaly ahead and then Wexford hit 12 of the last 15 scores. So what, what I'm thinking here, if you were to put on your Offaly hat there, which rarely comes off, you're talking about a team that was close to Clare last week and obviously Clare took over down the stretch and you're leading midway through the second half here. Now, Michael Fenley says, we didn't really expect much from this league. We're focused on what we can do in the championship later in the year. That'll be in the Joe McDonough. But do you take... Do you take many positives out of the fact that you've led Wexford after 47 minutes and you were only a point behind Clare, I think, after 59 minutes the week before? Or are you looking at the collapses and thinking that's worrying? No, I'd, I'd, I'd much prefer to be in those positions after an hour rather than, you know, as Cork did to us in the, in the uh, second round of the league, the game was over after five minutes, basically, and they'd hit, uh, or they'd had a hat trick of goals after 12 minutes. I'd much rather be competitive for. 45 50 minutes and tire and be beaten down the stretch than to not be competitive at all so no i take i would take a good bit of solace from the last two games to be honest with you um claire obviously blew us away in the last quarter and wexford kind of steamrolled us in the last quarter the other day but if that's you know if that's a conditioning problem and it's a matter of you know it's taken that much out of you for 50 or 55 minutes to go up go toe to toe against the big teams that's something that can be, you know, worked on and really, you can really, really go after that over, you know, over a couple of years. Whereas, you know, if your hurling is just a mile off and teams are absolutely, you know, teams are, you know, really dominating you, that's something that's a lot more demoralizing. I think, I think there's an awful lot that they can take from, from the last two games in particular. Um, and it's, it's a good sign. Like it's a good sign that, they're getting better steadily as the league goes on. Listen, we're never we're never going to win one of the group games. That's just the, that's just the nature of it. But providing they can, you know, remain competitive with Limerick for stages, you're going into that relegation playoff against Antrim. You know, in in decent enough health, the last thing you want to do is ship ship a big loss to Limerick the next day. And Limerick will be absolutely, you know, they'll be going gung ho for a big result. I'm sure. Um, but I'd, I'd be happy enough with how things are going. I have to say, I think they've turned the corner, turned the corner nicely, largely used the same personnel throughout as well. So, yeah, I think it's good exposure for them. And I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised the other day. Yeah. And as you said, as we've said a few times, Limerick play Offaly in the last group game. So they've both played the same four teams. Offaly have actually scored more than Limerick in those four games, which... I'm sure you're surprised to see the smirk on your face is that you're probably surprised and, you know, happily surprised to hear that. Bazaroni says, I think Antrim will put it up against Limerick in the relegation. <laughs> oh, go on, Baz! I think that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, <laughs> no doubt about that. Uh, Wexford have won all four of their games. So as we've already said, they're directly into the semi-finals now at this stage because Galway and Clare can't catch them up. They've conceded just 67 if you convert goals to points. So that's really good over the course, over the course of four games there. Um can we read too much into this from a Wexford point of view or just, you know, it's what you'd expect really. Rory O'Connor scoring 111. Kevin Foley had a very good game. He scored a couple as did Conan Flood and Conor McDonald. Yeah, I, well, I think like Wexford really had to get themselves up for the first couple of games. They probably weren't up to the up to the pitch of this, but had the class in the wind-up. Rory O'Connor got an absolutely beautiful goal as well, hit some lovely points. He has that lovely trademark off the left under the stand in Wexford Park Point. It's nearly he has it nearly trademarked uh, at this stage. Um, more game time into the into the kind of new faces. Um, Connor Connor Devitt, Conal Flood, Charlie McGuckian, who was obviously he'd have a fair Offaly connection because his father, Shane, won All-Ireland Offaly in 1994. So he was going back against what would be seen, I'm sure, as the second county. But um, Wexford are sitting pretty now. They've Cork coming to town for the last game. They're already through to a league semi-final. Interesting to see how, how they treat that. 
I'd imagine both teams will run the run the panel again because they're going to be true. Uh, you don't you see it's a kind of tricky situation. You don't want to be overloading guys. I'd imagine a lot of new a lot of uh, fringe players will play for both teams and then they'll put go with their go with their best starting fifteen for the league semi final because you can't. You can't just go for the four games, then go for the fifth, sixth, and potentially seventh, and then think you're going to be hundred uh, percent right for for Leinster. You want to keep something in the tank a small bit, but Wexford are in a in a great position, a, a position that few thought they'd be in as well. Yeah, just a reminder brought to you by orgaretro.com. Use the promo code our game and you get fifteen percent off. There's four jerseys on screen there, but there's any amount of them at their website. And as I said, fifteen percent off the promo code our game. Also, subscribe to the channel if you're not uh, if you're only new to the channel. Subscribe on YouTube. There are any of the different social channels. Don't miss anything. And patreon.com forward slash our game. That's the only place you'll see the Thursday shows. So Kerry battered Mead in Division Two A. They were 216 to 16 up by the break, and uh, Shane Nolan scored one three. Shane Conway scored six points. They were able to take lads off as the game was going on. Very, very impressive there, and they're they're top of their division with three wins from four games. There, well, uh, I'll just I'll just give the other results, and maybe you can reflect on it. Then, Chris Nolan scored a last minute point from a 75th minute sideline ball to give Carlo a 20 points to 214 draw with Kildare, and down they had that win over Westmead we talked about earlier. Bit of a shock there. Both sides missed penalties in this game, which is quite something. But Down started off with a goal through Owen Sands early on and finished the game with five points in a row. So, I mean, Down could be looking at Division 1 next year if they, they have that final regulation game at home to Kerry, win that and you're guaranteed a final. And then, hey, they could be up against the big boys next year. Yeah, it'd be some um, some rags to kind of riches story. Like they re- like in fairness to Ronan Sheehan, and I I know uh, like he is at the absolute heartbeat of Down Hurling, and has been involved uh, the last couple of years with them, and has you know they've made massive massive strides. But I I still I still can't I'm still surpri- surprised at that result. Even looking back at it now, that is it's a huge kind of statement win. They're gone you know gone from being beaten by Kildare in a, in a Chris Serene Cup final. To you know, being on the foot of Division One hurling, I actually played Division One hurling against Down. Would you believe back in the day in two thousand and seven? I think it was. Um, but like, there's an awful lot of water under the bridge for both counties since then. But Bad definitely, for you. The, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> there's the, the River Thames has gone under the bridge <laughs> in in that amount of time uh, since, but. On the flip side of it, you know, it is you'd have to say it's a big setback for Joe Fortune in Westmead. Doesn't like they're gonna like I, I don't even know if it's mathematically possible for them to get out of division two now at this stage and having come down from division one last year, they would have been expected to bounce back up. And you know, they're going into a Leinster championship later this year, and they would have wanted to have a division one place booked by that stage, and it doesn't look like that's gonna happen now. So that's a big setback for them. Yeah, Division 2B, London beat Wicklow 316 to 19. Derry had a convincing win over Donegal 23 points to 15, and Sligo beat Mayo 413 to 19 points. Just on that one, Shane, that's a huge win for Sligo. Sligo were in Division 3B a couple of years ago, and now they're given their, they, they, well, like they're going to be probably third place in Division 2B, and it, like Mayo would have been seen, you know, to be, you know, a couple of divisions and a class above them in recent years. Um, but Sligo, they've you know they've done serious work there. Gerald O'Kelly Lynch, we we keep saying, just puts up massive, massive scores every week, and that's a massive result for them. And it's disappointing for Mayo because you know in recent months they've been beaten by Leitrim and they've been beaten by Sligo. And this is a team that won the Nicky Racker last year and going to be competing in the Christie Ring this year. So uh, disappointing for them. Just a couple of other results there. Uh, Division 3A, uh, good, right good win for Roscommon, 217 to 119 against Armagh. Tyrone uh, remain unbeaten, 314 to Monans, 111. And Warwickshire and Loud played out a 313 to 119 draw. Then in Division 3B, Fermanagh, 4 from 4. Now I think they beat Lancashire, 222 to 9 points. And Longford and Leitrim, that sounded like a bit of an epic up in Pierce Park. Longford won 15, Leitrim won 14. Yeah, and uh, just a comment here from Bert Giggles, Ash Tiger. Wexford played well, three or four players in great form, but basically playing with their full team out for the four games, minus Chin, and maybe one or two more form won't carry forward for the year. If this is a bit tongue-in-cheek from Sherp2U1, if Wexford win Leinster, Davey will take credit for laying the groundwork, big wink. 
Uh, Joe Butler, are you back to starting the program at 12 noon from here on? I think sometimes it just depends on the guests. And, you know, for example, you have to move things around the odd time to get somebody in. So we'll just kind of have to play it by ear a little bit on that front. Uh, the All-Ireland Senior Camogie Club final was on at the weekend. Sarsfields beat Owler to Ballad 3-12 to 4-5 there. So seven goals always makes for an exciting game. It was only 10 weeks ago that Sars had won, or sorry, that um, Owler to Ballad had won their All-Ireland title. So what a turnaround for Sars. And I think it was Siobhan McGrath was saying, it was work rate that won it for us. We didn't match their work rate last December, and we had to do that today. A good start is something we really targeted coming into it. Owler to Bala, every single game they played, they got unbelievable starts. We knew if we were to have any chance, we couldn't let them get a good start. We need to get the good start ourselves, which they did. And uh, in the intermediate final, St. Rhinus, they're going up to senior level next year because they're after winning two in a row of All-Ireland Intermediates, 5-14 to 2-6 against Salt Hill and Ochnacara. So great for them. A uh, real complete performance from them, in fairness, and uh, they're ready. They're ready to go up to senior level. It's obviously going to be a massive, uh, massive step up. But back to back All Ireland titles, um, they, like it's as good as a. They're the setup is as good as a, any Camogie County team that I know of. You have Mark and Molly Dunn. Mark is manager. Molly is coach. You have uh, Declan Kelly in there as well. Ron S and C coach. Two other selectors as well. Serious, serious setup. And, you know, in Kate Kenny, they have an absolute gem of a player. Brilliant player. Uh, Camogie or ladies football does, doesn't matter. You know, yeah, fair, fair play to them. Um, it's it's hard. It's not that it's hard, but awfully Camogie uh, is probably suffering at the moment because of the lack of the Rhinus girls in with them. And like you'd have to wonder whether they're all going to go. I think Kate Kenny's going kicking football with awfully this year. So awfully Camogie is... At the, the county team is in you know quite a poor state at the moment whereas the club scene is in a really really healthy state and just a word uh from one of our viewers there as well, as well about the hopper mcgrath um fair old go and he four four daughters involved yesterday and you know their second title in in three years i think crow park probably suited them a bit more than our just even with age profile and the way they play uh, and just how you know they're seriously, seriously athletic side, and they just outworked Outer yesterday. Uh, that's not to take anything away from from the Outer women. Um, they will always have that that All Ireland before Christmas. Just came up a bit short yesterday, but uh, a real great advertisement. Uh, great to have it on the telly yesterday as well. Yeah. So we'll talk a bit of football now. It might get you to stick your head off to one side. First off, Longford beat West Mead by fourteen points to ten. But then something that became a big thing on Twitter over the weekend. <laughs> I see an all, there was a huge amount of criticism. I put it up on Twitter. It has over 70,000 views at this stage. So, like, talk about something going viral. And it was a huge amount of comments, absolutely slating it. Um, but I thought, like, there's obviously a real reason for this. I, and someone commented saying they were solo on tennis balls in another warm-up for another game. I didn't see that, so I'm not entirely sure if that's the case. Get your comments in and let us know if they did. But there's got to be a reason for that, whether it's like your feet are the main thing with the tackle, just take your arms out of the equation and see how, you can, how close you can get by just using your feet only or it's forcing you to stay upright or, or whatever it might be. But it is very easy to jump on a team then when they lose 315 to 3-9 as they did in Brewster Park. Ah, uh, well, uh, the GA, we love hopping all over each other, don't we? And we don't like people doing anything different, uh, particularly if it's not seen to work. Remember, Keen O'Neill got an awful bashing over those occlusion goggles that time. Mm. Like, it's not as if they were being pulled out in training every night. Far from it. I think he said they used them once or twice, and it was nearly just for something different. Uh, funny enough, that, that one there, um, it's obviously just, to, as you said, to promote the man staying, staying tall. I think Donny Buckley has, has used something like that before. And like if Donny Buckley was using it, probably people wouldn't be saying as much about it. Uh, I heard a good one before, actually. Boys down in Wexford were playing club football. I think it was club like intermediate football. And, you know, the manager reckoned the amount of guys in the opposition team at that level that could kick a point from 35, 40 yards was very, very low. So he actually got them tackling almost with their hands behind their back so that they weren't allowed to let a stray hand in. But So they were just kind of shadowing a lad. And if he was able to kick it over the bar from 35 or 40 yards, that was grand. But they weren't going to give him handy freeze. Um, that was just another, another take on that. I'm not sure about the technique there because I would have thought 
that you'd be down lower in a kind of a squat position to give yourself a stronger base rather than standing tall where you're almost, you, you know, your core wouldn't be as strong as, whereas like in hurling, like you're always told to be down. It's almost like arse out, down nice and low, get a strong base so that you can't be knocked over. So I'm not sure exactly of the, the mechanics behind that, but I have no issue with that. Uh, with somebody trying something different, far from it. And yeah. like we're we're like we're always told about the GA players being robots and everything like that. Trying something different like that, I, I don't see any problem. I'm sure like it's not as if with these things, it's not as if they're spending an hour on it every night. It's probably a couple of minutes every night. Like, but people oh people know people hate when when <clears throat> different things are done that are, you know, away from the norm, shall we say. Yeah, and I think even using stuff like activation bands years ago. Well, not not all that long ago, people would have thought you're a bit unusual if you brought out the activation bands. But I suppose now, when you when we're in the era of like Premiership soccer being on TV, and you see, you know, they're they're uh, zooming in on the players as they're doing their warm up routines beforehand, just to kind of mix up the pictures and just show you something different. And they're using them. I think people have become quite conditioned to them being there at this point. By I the wouldn't way, be able. I wouldn't be able to warm up without them now. No, no, no. I'd be at nothing. And I'd say a lot of players over the years missed out on a huge amount of playing GA in different sports simply because they didn't have activation bands or even a foam roller or something like that. Uh, by the way, if you want to know more about Fermanagh's win over Leash, uh, there's a match report from Declan Bogue, video match report from Brewster Park, so check that out on the YouTube channel. Now, Galway had a, a good win over, over Offaly, but Offaly still put up 3-10 on them, so it's a pretty good showing from John Mahan's side. Uh, of the 217 that Galway hit, 216 was from play, four wins from four, and Park Joyce said afterwards, Conceding 310 is very high again after conceding 217 last week. Again, our defensive shape was brilliant in the first couple of games. It seems to be letting us down over the last two games. It's an area we've got to look at differently. They're up against Clare in Tune next Sunday, and then their promotion uh, hopes will probably be decided by tough away games against Roscommon and Derry. So Galway are going well, but what about Offaly? In a bit of relegation trouble, but you know that's not a bad performance. No, to be honest, they were always going to be in relegation trouble. Um, missed the boat a small bit against me, conceding that goal in the last minute. But again, this is it. Like they've gotten better as the league has gone on. Um, one uh, might have only scored one ten against me, but put up a good show and should have got a result three ten against Galway. Um, like I, I, I thought this would be you know ten point defeat if I, if I'm being honest with you because Galway are absolutely flying it. But we managed. We put up a very good score. It's not too often you'd be you'd be scoring three ten and losing the league game. Show me how many teams would put have put up that type of score and come out on the wrong side. A um, couple of big games coming up, uh, playing down in the in their you know in one of their last three games. Going to have to get a result of some kind there. Um, they're going to have to beat down and end up on three points and hope that Mead uh, don't pick up any more points and that Down don't pick up any more points. But I realistically, I'd say it is going to come down to the Down game. Yeah. Do you want to give a bit of insight or background on the Cavan Sligo game there? Yeah, no bother at all. Yeah, good win for a good win for Cavan. Even though you know it's a Division Four game, they, you know many would wouldn't uh, think that they should be in Division Four. They fe- finished Cavan one thirteen, Sligo ten points. So I think Paddy Lynch, Paddy Lynch got a lucky goal after sixty three minutes, and that was the game's turning point. Um, it put the Ulster side ahead for the first time. That was one seven to eight points. They kicked on, uh, outscored Sligo six points to two. Uh, thereafter, uh, I think Sean Carabine was sent to the sin bin, which uh, left Sligo down to 13 players after David Quinn was sent off before that. Um, Cavan were down to 14 at the same time with Michael Argue in the bin, but uh, you just can't you can't afford to be down two players at any given time, definitely not. And definitely, um, I was just following kind of this game when it was in uh, when it was in Walsh Park yesterday. This is like you know an under 14 scoreline. Uh, Tipperary 4-4, four, four, uh, Wexford 15 points, you know, 15 scores to 8, and the 8 comes out on top. Um, just a mad, mad scoreline. I think it was 3-1 to 10 points at one stage as well. Um, just haven't seen anything like that in a while. But a uh, huge result for Tipperary. Gives them, they might have a slim hope of being promoted still, even though results went against them in the first couple of games. But that would just about keep their slim hopes alive. But yeah, a big result. And I was only saying to a couple of the tip lads after the match yesterday, like it is, it's an under 12 or an under 14 result. And the same lad scored the 4-4, which usually be the case back in the day. It's e- easier to score goals and, than points. Uh, actually, Teddy Doyle scored a couple of the goals here. He's from Temple No and Kerry, and he so he scored two of them. 
Connor Sweeney score Connor Sweeney scored one one, and I'm just trying to see who scored the other one. Sean O'Connor, who scored the goal against Sligo in that four point win last week. So after a pretty indifferent start to the league, Tipperary are looking okay, and like four four is a fairly ludicrous scoreline. But hey, we're willing to take it here. Is there anything else uh, before we finish up? Yeah, no, just the last one. We probably skipped over it. Longford had a right good win against Westmead that I wouldn't have been expecting. Uh, 14 points to 10. I think they dominated the last kind of quarter of the game. They had been, you know, they'd been struggling in the league before this game and Westmead were seen as, probably would have been seen as the main promotion candidates in that division. So, massive result. Billy, Billy O'Loughlin said at the start of the league that they were putting all their eggs in the league basket. Uh, didn't look like that was working out too well up until now, but that's that's a huge win, particularly in Mullingar. Bad bad weekend in Mullingar for for Westmead GA losing two games that have probably cost them promotion in both hurling and football. Who are our goats of the week then? So I suppose I'm gonna I'm gonna lean towards Chad Wire just because of all the scores this weekend that probably has the biggest material effect for the rest of the season. They're more or less avoiding relegation because they won what will end up being a de facto semi-final. And in football then, do you know what? I'm going to go local, even though he's a, an import. Teddy Doyle of uh, Tipperary scoring the two goals there. Uh, my go of the week, hurling go of the week, is Stephen Bennett. He was 116 yesterday. It's amazing how scores like that are just becoming commonplace. I think it was 11 frees. 65 and 1 4 from play. He scored a point, um, he scored a point from out around his own 65 where he put the ball up in the air or hit the ball so high up in the air to make sure he wasn't blocked. Um, just he's capable of doing that every day. Don't think he missed a free yesterday. Um, I don't have a football go of the week, Shane, to be honest with you, because I, did, I didn't see enough football. So I'm just going to Steve, give Stephen Bennett my GA go of the week. Well, Anton Sullivan scored 1 3 for Offaly. I want to give it to him. It's hard I, on the losing side. It's hard to give the go to the losing side. I feel like you're nearly patronising them. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, that's it for the show today. Uh, subscribe to patreon.com forward slash our game if you want to get Thursday's show. We're going to have a great show as we always do for you. Uh, Orgaretro.com forward. Uh, use the promo code our game to get 15% off any of their brilliant jerseys. There, Michael. We'll be chatting to you again. Good and soon.